Hey everyone, this is Will. Welcome to Mini Canron Uncourse Hangout. I believe it's number 14. We will see what we're going to do today. Uh, I've got lots of fun stuff that I could show off, but we'll see if anyone else has stuff. And also, Ambrose is here, so maybe we could talk about type inference in Mini Canron, which is a subject I'm interested in, and also uh, someone recently pinged me about uh, writing a type inferencer or maybe. Uh, doing like gradual typing or something like that using a type inferencer written in Mini Canron, so maybe we can talk to Ambrose about that. Anyway, welcome. Uh, so does anyone have anything they want to show off first, or uh, maybe we could talk to Ambrose um, uh, about type inference first in case uh, he's got to leave, um, and then could maybe show off some of the stuff I've been working on, which I think is actually pretty cool. And Michael, so even to um, get back up to speed with my previous ex experimentations of type inference in Mini Canron, and then we'll talk about it later. Okay, so you're going to get up to speed in the first half an hour, and then the rest of the show we'll talk about. It? Well, I, I one of my first things I did with Mini Canon was play around with type inference, and I got to a particular point, and then I was like, I need constraints or whatever, and then I haven't used. Mini counter and seriously, uh, since constraints were kind of added to mm. core logic and yeah, so yeah. Yeah, well, I guess the other part of that is you know you may find that you don't have the, all the constraints you want. You probably yeah. will find that's the case, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. That's more like a hey, what what should we add to Mini Canron to make writing type inferencers nicer, right? So. Yeah, that would be very interesting to see kind of what you have trouble with. Uh, and I also, you know, I wonder if you could write, I haven't seen this done in Mini Canon yet. You know, it'd be really cool to see a program that is a type checker and a type inferencer and does type habitation and maybe even gradual typing where you have user level annotations that are type annotations, but you can put a fresh variable there, right? Oh. And that might let you do both type checking and do like stuff like gradual typing, where the user can put in the types where they, you know, know them or want to express them, and they can put in a fresh logic variable when they want the system to infer them. Well, so, my first reaction was, let's build a checker first and mm -hmm. <laughs> worry about inference later, because uh, you know, let's add the annotation syntax mm -hmm. and then let Mini Canon do something, and then kind of gradually take away some annotations. Uh, I, I agree. I just think that, you know, it's once you add the annotations, when you think in, from a Mini Canron standpoint, you realize that any piece of code is actually optional in Mini Canron because you can always put a logic variable there, right? So uh, yeah. it would be very interesting to see what would happen when you wrote something as a checker and if it would run, run backwards. Uh, and the other thing that I've been talking with Michael Valentine about um, is whether or not, you know, so, so we've been showing off recently in the Hangouts, you know, what happens when you run scheme code in the relational interpreter, just like write regular scheme code, right? Yeah. So it'd be really interesting to see if you could write, like, a little scheme checker, a type checker in scheme, just straight scheme, running under the relational interpreter in Mini Canron, and if you could make that type checker do type inference. That would also be a different take on things. That's kind of weird, but... I like so, it. Have you presented this in one of these Hangouts, the uh, the the interpreter that you were just talking about? Or? Yeah, we've been looking at that recently. Um, I've got some fun new stuff to show with that today. Oh, cool. Uh, so, yeah. Um, I think we're, you know, okay, let me put it this way. That relational interpreter now is actually really interesting. It's... Um, is slow because you have multiple levels of interpretation now. But I think there is a chance of radically speeding it up using some well-known techniques. In fact, Michael Ballantyne's working on that. Maybe Michael Ballantyne wants to even talk about search today. Awesome. Um, but, uh, but it's really interesting. It's really interesting to write a scheme program just as a regular scheme program and watch it run backwards. So the thing, actually, Michael Ballantyne, who's, who's in who's joined us today, um, you know, he was the one who really suggested this. He, he pointed out that you can write append. You know, so we always show appendo, and which is you know, also a classic example for prolog. So you have a version of append of two lists that runs backwards or in any mode. 
you can put logic variables anywhere in appendo, but if you just write schemes append and run that in the relational interpreter, you can put logic variables anywhere also, and it also runs backwards. And in fact, it's more general than appendo because you can do all sorts of tricks you can't do with appendo. Uh, so that's really fascinating, and we've been playing around with that a lot recently. So I even have some new results as of uh, yesterday morning that I can show off. Um, anyway, well, so, okay, so Ambrose, so you don't want to talk about the uh, type transfer right now? I want to hear what you've got to say, and maybe I'll have some ideas later on. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Fair enough. Okay. Uh, all right. Well, anyone else have anything they want to show off right now? Otherwise, you know, I don't know, maybe Michael Ballantyne wants to talk about some things or can show off some of the, the fun stuff been working on with Setbang. Uh, Orchid or David, uh, yeah, you all have anything uh, uh, to talk about or anyone else? Yeah, so apparently we talked about scheme append and hangout number seven. Okay. Um, okay, no one's biting. Uh, Michael, do you want to talk about anything? You want to talk I about search? Or? I have some, some graphics to kind of show it off for today, but I, I think it's going to be hard to explain without any drawings. Um, I didn't have time to make any, so I might delay that until a later hangout. Okay, so, so like the back jumping and that sort of thing? Yeah, back jumping and and uh, and the kind of breadth of search. I think both of those are easier to explain if you can draw. So sure. Well, can can you just give like a, a high level description of what the back jumping's about or the clause learning's about? Yeah. Just like you know, some intuition maybe. Yeah. So I mean, it's an idea that we're trying to take from SAT solving, Boolean satisfiability. And um, in SAT solving, you've got a fixed number of logic variables that you set to true or false. Um, you have to find uh, set true or false values that will satisfy a set of uh, Boolean equations. And so kind of the usual algorithm, you proceed and you assign, kind of tentatively assign um, a logic variable. And kind of you proceed along the list until you come up with some problem. And you have to backtrack. Um, but you gain efficiency if you can look at why the last assignment that you tried failed. If the reason it failed was an assignment that you made uh, way further back, you know, one of the first couple of assignments you made, then you can go back and, and now you know that you must change that original assignment, that early assignment. Um, then you can gain some efficiency. So we'd like to do something kind of similar in Mini Canron. Um, but it's a little bit trickier because we don't have a fixed number of logic variables. And indeed, you know, as you go down different branches for the first assignments, you introduce different new fresh logic variables. Um, so it's a little bit trickier to figure out how to do. Uh, they figured it out for prologue, for depth for search. Um, and there, you kind of figure out why unification failed. And you can figure out how much, how far back on the depth first search stack you can jump, based on the reason that the unification failed. Um, but for Mini Canon, we don't just have a stack representing the state. We have this whole kind of tree of the partially instantiated streams, um, and so that makes it a little trickier to figure out kind of how to thread through the new knowledge that you gain in a way that informs all of those pieces of the search. Yeah, so, so the, I mean, I guess the way I think about it is there are certain times where we keep failing over and over and over again in sort of the same way, and we want to be able to learn through the search process um, that we're failing in a certain way so that we can avoid that in the future. And it, it is, it does seem trickier. Uh, so Dave is asking, is that the same as dependency-directed backtracking in propagators also? Is this like propagators as in uh, Alexei Radul's work with Jerry Sussman on like the propagator stuff, or is this with like constraint, general constraint propagation? Uh, Radul and Sussman. Okay, well I didn't, uh, I haven't looked at that, but I guess, uh, I guess Michael, that's probably something we should look at. Yep. Is, um, okay, so well, thanks, thanks for that pointer. I mean, I'm not surprised that they would have similar issues, and 
Was that uh, was that depth for search, or was it a more complex, complete search? Uh, yeah, do, uh, David, do you know what their search uh, algorithm was? They're probably even working on general graphs, not just uh, trees, right? Be my guess. Uh, they have a complex scheduler. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Um, might even be fun to bring Alexi on uh, if he'd be interested in joining us one of these days. Oh, by the way, I'll just throw out one other thing. I've been thinking for a while about doing like another Hangout series, um, which would be you know maybe less targeted than this one. You know, this is very much Mitty Cameron related, uh, but something a little wider might talk about uh, functional programming or logic programming or dependent types or things like that. So sort of like cool stuff that's going on that I would like to learn about. And uh, so Michael and I have talked about this a little bit. Um, just kind of thinking of ideas of, of what that might look like. Um, so anyway, if anyone has any thoughts about that, uh, please uh, please let me know. Be curious if either people would be interested in that or what sort of things you'd be interested in or like to see. Uh, but yeah, so propagators are, are a really interesting thing. So that's, uh, yeah, that's definitely something we should look at. And propagators supposedly subsume logic programming. Um, so it, it might, might be interesting to see to what extent you could do some of the stuff we're doing in, in something like the propagator networks. OK. Anyone else have anything they want to talk about or show off? Or uh, should, we, should we look at some of the stuff I've been playing with more recently? No one's going to bite. OK. All right. Uh, yeah. Any progress on TA from last weekend? What's TA? Tree Automata. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. I said I was going to do Tree Automata last weekend, didn't I? I say I'm going to do Tree Automata every weekend. <sighs> I need more, more hours in the day. Well, I haven't worked on it. So, you know, sometimes you can use distract or you can use uh, avoidance to be good, right? Like, I should be working on tree automata. I should be working on lots of things. I should be working on tree automata, but I haven't. But I've been working on other fun mini camera stuff instead. So, uh, I guess that's the problem. I'm cursed with enough interesting mini camera projects right now that, uh, you know, I should be working on tree automata, but I work on something else instead. So. I will show you something that I worked on instead of Tree of uh, And arguably, you could argue whether or not it's uh, more or less interesting than Tree of but I'll show you what I was working on. Yes, I definitely want to work on Tree of uh, I'll tell you why I haven't been working on Tree of uh, Basically, I'm working on a paper for Oopsla, and Michael's working on that with me. And that paper... The, the thing I have in, in mind for this paper is sort of like the mother of all relational programming demos, or relational interpreter demos, I guess. If you're familiar with the 1968 Engelbart mother of all demos where you showed off the mouse and all this really cool stuff, right? You know, that was really powerful, like just showing all the neat stuff you can do. And uh, recently we've been doing some really neat stuff with relational interpreters, and this stuff hasn't really been shown off. Like people see quines, and quines is cool, but... Uh, I think we have a lot more interesting stuff to show off now than Quine's. So the, well, the part paper I have in mind is like, let's just show a bunch of really neat stuff we can do with the relational interpreters, and uh, maybe not even get into the details of like how we're doing it so much, but just showing a bunch of stuff we can do. And maybe it will jog, maybe it will inspire people to try to look into the style of programming more. Because I think there are some really neat things we can do, and I keep finding more stuff every time I play around with it. And also it might, um, I don't know, I mean, I'm hoping that when people see it, they'll be like, well, you might want to look at X, or, you know, have you tried doing Y? And that's that's how we make a lot of progress, right? Like, you know, so when Dan and I showed off this thing at ClosureCon, the relational interpreter, that's when Stu Holloway said, well, you can do quines with that, right? So that led us uh, in interesting direction. So every time I show this stuff to people, 
you know, they, they give me good feedback on, well, have you tried doing X? So, uh, in fact, that happened yesterday. Brian Mastenbrook on Twitter uh, had a really interesting suggestion, which maybe we'll play with today. Um, yeah, Daniel said, uh, the conj demo you guys did is what got me started in this area. So, I mean, I think that's just really fun stuff. I think there's a big part, I mean, there's a place, I think, in computer science, right, in programming for just things that are, are really interesting ideas, and that's why I love the relational interpreter so much. It just, I, I find it really fascinating to work on. Uh, so I, I think, you know, and, and my hope is that we will keep coming up with better techniques and, and implementation, and at some point, this won't just be a really interesting thing to work on. It'll actually be a really practical approach to programming. But um, you know, we still have, I think, so work to do before before it's going to be super practical. But at least right now, it's it's really interesting and inspiring. I think at least I'm inspired by it. So um, I want to concentrate on that end. Like, let's just show a bunch of really neat stuff we can do that is kind of mind blowing, and then hopefully, you know, that will interest people, and they're going to want to learn about it or or try, you know, maybe people will come up with other ways of doing it. Maybe people will do SAT solvers or SMT solvers or data log solvers, just like that. They'll figure out how to do similar things that maybe run faster or more efficient or whatever. So, um, you know, it's part of a, you know, I think the Brett Victor demos are really interesting because even though he doesn't give away the source code, you know, he's showing off interesting things that make people think, right? So they, they may not even be super practical. Sometimes they might be. You get things like light table out of it, but um, just making people think about things in different ways. I think that's that's what this paper would be about. I think um, so. Michael uh, and I have been talking about some different ideas uh, for showing cool demos. Uh, Michael's got a list of three things, three sorts of programs we really want to show off, and one of them I'm going to show you today is the first time it's ever been publicly shown. Uh, and in fact, I don't even think Michael has seen the latest version of this, so I think maybe he'll get a kick out of it. And I will tell you that the code still sucks. There's still lots and lots of problems with these interpreters, okay? Um, some of the problems I've figured out in the last couple days. Uh, basically, this interpreter has just kicked my ass all sorts of ways. And I can tell you about some of the problems. The other thing is that I should probably share this tiddly wiki that I've been working on. Uh, Michael introduced me to this tiddly wiki system for keeping notes. So I've got like a research notebook. I've got a couple tiddly wikis uh, uh, entries on this interpreter. So I should probably put that in the repo also. But I did just uh, commit <clears throat> the repo. Uh, I can send you all the link to it. And uh, so, so you might want to take a look at that thing. Uh, here we go. I will put this in chat. This is the relational interpreter with Setbang. I just uh, commented, com uh, committed before starting this. And the uh, the readme for that repo shows off some of the interesting examples. But uh, without further ado, uh, let's uh, get into it. Hey, Peter. Welcome. And Parker. Welcome, everyone. OK, so let's show this off. So this is going to be, uh, let, me, let me hype it up a little bit, OK? Let me hype this up a little bit. This is going to be. Uh, the first public demo of this relational interpreter that has Setbang in it. And we played a little, little bit before with relational interpreters of Setbang, but we've never done it, never tried to push it in this direction. Okay? And uh, let me set the stage. So before, in a previous Hangout, we showed a relational scheme interpreter that handled errors explicitly. I forget which Hangout that was in. Uh, that was a couple a couple weeks ago. Showed a relational interpreter that you could put in an error message, and it will generate programs that give you that error message. Okay. Uh, so that's that's fun and interesting. And Michael and I were talking about this some more, and you know we we started talking about well, wouldn't it be neat to have um, a relational interpreter that could generate programs with unspecified behavior? Okay. And this is this is a problem that comes up in fuzz testing. So fuzz testing is when you try generating lots and lots of random inputs or lots of random programs or whatever and try running them through a compiler, let's say, to try to find errors in the compiler. And uh, John Regera at Utah, who has both an awesome blog and has been doing really cool research in fuzzing for a long time, um, so that's one of the things he's really interested in is how do you fuzz test, uh, say, GCC or something like that, 
and feed in and uh, programs that are uh, have undefined behavior, and maybe that will break the interpreter or the compiler in different ways or whatever. In Scheme, there is one interesting, uh, especially interesting source of undefined behavior, and that's the procedure evaluation. So if you evaluate, if you do a procedure call in Scheme, if you say have a procedure or function f and you're applying it to arguments a and b, um, well, really in Scheme you don't necessarily have a function f and you don't necessarily have values a and b you're applying f to. It's more like you have three expressions, e1, e2, and e3, and hopefully e1 will evaluate to a procedure and e, e2 and e3 will evaluate to values that will be passed into the procedure. But in Scheme, there's nothing in the spec that tells you whether or not e1 will be evaluated before e2 and e3. Will the evaluation order be left to right, right to left, interleaving? You know, schemes implementations are free to handle this however they want. In Racket, which used to be Dr. Scheme and now it's Racket, um, I think they actually say that it's always left or right. I believe that's the case. Maybe maybe someone who knows Racket better can clarify that. Um, but in Scheme, certainly, it's up to the implementation. And Shea Scheme in particular, or at least Petit Shea Scheme, tends to go right to left. Uh, I think it might change depending on what's more efficient or whatever. But um, so you can you can take the same scheme expression and you can run it in Racket to get left to right evaluation of application, and you can run it in Shea scheme or Petit Shea scheme to get right to left evaluation, and you can see if you get the same answer back. If you don't have any effects in your program, like an effect would be like a set bang or a print statement or an infinite loop technically is an effect. Uh, or an error is an effect. Okay, so if you don't have any of those in your program, then you shouldn't be able to tell the difference between left to right and right to left evaluation. But if you have an effect, then you can tell the distinction. And in particular, if you add, uh, we've added setbang, that's what we've been playing around with recently, adding setbang to a relational interpreter, and then trying to do things like infer a scheme program that will give you different values when you evaluate procedure application, say, left to right versus right to left. You can also try all possible interleavings of evaluations, although obviously that's kind of expensive. Um, but anyway, that's, that's what I'm going to show you is a relational interpreter that has setbang in it and has two interpreters, really. One that has left to right evaluation of both procedure application and, say, cons, you know, and you know, cons primitive. Uh, which you can also evaluate left to right or right to left. I mean, really, cons is just a function. Uh, we're treating it as a build-in. Uh, but if you treat it as just a function, then it's going to inherit the evaluation order you get from application. Anyway, so, so the interesting thing is once you have setbang, you can actually detect differences in evaluation order from left to right to right to left. And what we're going to do is try and give some queries to Minikandrin to get Minikandrin to infer for us um, programs that differ in evaluation. And we'll see what we can do. And it's it's kind of cool. It's kind of interesting It's uh, and thought-provoking. So I think it could be pushed significantly further. Uh, but it's, it was kind of kind of interesting exercise. And also, like I said, it was actually really hard to write this interpreter and get it to perform right. I kept running into all sorts of weird behavior. And some of it I figured out. Some of it I still am having trouble with. Um, Let's see. Uh, Michael Ballantyne says left to right in Racket is specified in the docs. OK. All right. Um, and Ambrose says map is right to left in Shea. Yeah, so map in Scheme doesn't specify evaluation order. Uh, for each is left to right. For each is specifically designed to work with effects, but map is not specified. And, and Shea uh, goes right to left for map. And I'll tell you an example, uh, example of running into this in real life. Um, years ago, when I was first learning Scheme, my first serious Scheme program was uh, a, a simulator for the Enigma crypto system, like the German World War II crypto system. Uh, so I wrote this Enigma simulator, and for some of my simulations, I was using uh, it, it was for an attack on Enigma, basically. Um, anyway, that's that's a different story. But um, uh, I had calls to the random number seed. I was generating a new random number seed and calling random, right? And, uh, and random has an effect because it changes the internal state, right? Um, so I had all of these tests, and I was calling random in application position. 
because I was using a let, and I didn't realize let was the same as application and all this stuff. So I had all of these calls to random, which are effectful calls in application position, and I didn't realize that that was not a good thing to do. Um, I could have done nested lets or let star, but just having it in, as lets was not good. And then I went from doctor scheme at the time to Shea scheme, which was faster. Uh, this was before our doctor racket had like a JIT or anything. It was way faster, but all my tests broke because my side effects and application position, Shea was doing right to left instead of left to right, so nothing worked anymore. So <laughs> that was my first experience with this case. All right. So enough of the lead up. Let me show you. Let me show you some some fun stuff. Hopefully you'll find it interesting. I certainly did. Um, yeah. So let's see here. Share my Emacs window. Oh. All right. Okay, so let's look. Okay, so this is this is the GitHub repo I have, relational interpreter with setbang. I just checked this in, and um, yeah, you know, typical will. I've got a bunch of files in there from from doing the research on this, and um, I don't really, uh, I haven't added to the readme yet, like what all the files are, and some of the files are in better shape than the other. What I did put in a readme is I. I'd say that the best of the interpreters right now is the curry two-direction, no shadowing one. I'll tell you what that means in a minute. Um, but this, is this version right here, curried interp, curried two directions, no shadowing. I love those naming schemes. Um, so this is actually two interpreters in this file. And one interpreter has left to right evaluation. And the other interpreter has right to left evaluation for application and for cons. Um, both interpreters handle the same subset of scheme, the same language, and that language includes curried procedures, so, so functions of one argument, an application, procedure application that, you know, or uh, procedures of one argument. So it's a curried language, and I did that to try to just simplify um, the evaluation rules. So curried language has setbang in it, um, and we could talk about how, yeah, it's setbang. Um, I think, I don't know if we talked about this uh, when we were talking about interpreters earlier, but, you know, the, the thing the thing is uh, you can write, you can add setbang to an interpreter by adding a store. So in addition to having an environment, which we've talked about before, you can have a store. You have to pass the store through differently than an environment. So an environment in our old interpreters maps a variable to a value, like x to 5, whereas in this model that has stores in addition to environments, the environment maps a variable to a location or address, sort of like an address in memory, and a store will map that address to the value. So you have this level of indirection between the environment and the store. And this allows you to update the store without uh, changing the environment. and um, also, the store is passed through monadically is the technical term for this. So, so in addition to having an input store, we have an output store at each step. Whereas an environment, you know, just uh, that just flows through the interpreter lexically with, with the lexical scope. So we don't need an output in. Anyway, that doesn't matter. That's sort of technical detail. People want to know more about it. I can definitely get into more details about it. Um, this is definitely talked about in things like essentials of programming languages. Um, that book. Uh, but anyway, it's a standard sort of thing. I'm just doing it relationally. There, there's nothing special about having a store. This is a, a very well, this is a tri tried and true technique for writing interpreters. The other thing is that we need to be able to produce new addresses whenever we do a procedure application, or if we had let, whenever we did let binding, we'd need a new address. So I also have an address counter that's, has, that's passed through monadically just like the store. I have an address in and an address out. Uh, turns out handling the address is a bit of a pain. Um, I'll get into that later, maybe. But uh, we're using piano numerals, so like Z or Z for zero, uh, successor of Z, S of Z for one, successor of successor of Z for two, and so forth. Um, and then otherwise, we just have 
the expression, the environment, and the value. Okay, so we just added the store and the address that's used by the store um, to the relational interpreter. Otherwise, it's the same. We have quote. We have variable lookup here. Now we have to do the variable lookup in two parts. So we look up the variable in the environment to get the address, and then we look up the address in the store to get the value. So we now have to do two lookups, and I think that actually has some divergence uh, and performance implications that are a little annoying. I don't know how to get around, but um, we have Lambda. Lambda hasn't really changed. We have setbangs. Setbang um, is basically just how you would do it, do setbang in a standard uh, interpreter with store passing style. Basically, you, if you want to setbang x, the variable x, to some value, the, the value of expression e, you evaluate e, and then you look up x in, in the environment, which will give you an address. So we're looking up x in the environment to get the address. And then we're going to extend the store, um, and we're going to say, OK, that address is now bound to the uh, value of the expression e. Anyway, it doesn't really matter exactly how that works. I think the more interesting thing is to see what the result is. Uh, here's cons, which I currently have commented out, because for the programs I'm trying to infer, uh, cons isn't strictly necessary, and it slows things down. But cons is sort of the normal thing for the most part. The tricky part is how the uh, environment uh, flows through. And uh, we have procedure application. And I did one kind of hack here to make things slow, uh, make things faster. And that's this quote, uh, rater is not equal to quote. Uh, the reason I did this was that because I have queried application, a procedure application looks like a rater applied to a RAM. So two argument list, two expression list. Uh, and, in, and in Scheme, application is not tagged. We don't have like an app tag or anything like that. We could add an app tag, but it wouldn't be scheme-like syntax. But because we have a list that has two expressions, it turns out that the procedure application line overlaps with the quote line. So quote is also a list that has two elements in it, right? Um, so quote and application are the only forms that overlap in this uh, interpreter. And it turned out that adding quote to the interpreter just sped thing, or slowed things down like immensely, and I couldn't understand why. And then I realized what was happening was, was because of this overlap, um, whenever we had a quote form, the procedure application line was kicking in, and it was doing all of this work and then failing when it tried to look up the uh, um, look up quote as a variable. It would fail because quote wasn't bound in the environment. That slowed things down immensely. So I just kind of hacked it and said, OK, we're not going to let you kind of override quote in that way. So you, you, right now, in this interpreter, you couldn't do something like lambda quote of something. You couldn't, you couldn't use quote as a variable name in this version of the interpreter, which is a little sucky, but um, maybe there's a better way around it. Anyway. That's a sort of technical detail. Most of these things are like kind of technical details. Uh, I want to spend too much time talking about those. Let me just go ahead and, and show you some of the neat examples. And then uh, if people want to talk about how it works, we can do that. All right. So here we go. Let's load up this file. And this file name is so long, I'm actually going to copy. Let's load it up. All right. Now uh, the key part is we have two different avalos, right? So um, let's do like a run one queue. We have you know, so normally we would write something like um, eval expo of no, I don't know lambda xx and some output value, right? But that's not going to work because now we have left to right and right to left. So I think it's just this righto. Is that right? Now what did I call it? I might have called it expert or something. Uh, eval left to righto. Oh, OK. 
All right, so we can see uh, left, left to right O works, and then there's a right to left O. And like I said, uh, the difference between these two is the order in which um, the arguments in a procedure application get evaluated. So if I go back to, my, to an application, if I say uh, lambda xx, lambda yy, in the left to right evaluation in this application, lambda xx will get evaluated. That's going to give us back a procedure. And then lambda yy will get evaluated. And that'll give us another procedure, and then we'll do the application, okay? Um, we can't actually tell the distinction between left to right and right to left with this program because we don't have any effects in the program. You know, it's, we're going to get back the same closure. So look, right to left and left to right, we get back the same closure in both cases. It's the same value, okay? So we actually need effects in our language, and that's where the setbang comes in, okay? And uh, just as a reminder, what setbang is, so if I say, you know, define x to be 5, if I uh, ask what x is, I get back 5. If I say setbang x to be 6, now x is 6, right? So this is like a side effect. Well, this is a very stateful thing. This is the sort of thing you get in C or, or Java or whatever. Uh, of course, Scheme supports that also. We have been avoiding setbang in, in Minicanron, but let's see what what happens when uh, when we actually use setbang. So, so let's go ahead and try to uh, write a query that will um, give us different answers. Uh, we'll try to infer a program that gives us a different value back when we evaluate left to right versus right to left. So let's see if we can come up with such a query. So let's get one answer back for an expression. We are going to uh, try to evaluate something. Right to left, evaluation of this expression um, will give us some value, say, VR for V right. Uh, so let's say we have a fresh VR and a V left, VL for V left. So if we evaluate the expression, which we don't know what the expression is yet, that's what we're trying to figure out, uh, from right to left we get VR, and if we do it from left to right, we get VL. And furthermore, make sure it's in the right scope, furthermore we want to make these, these values be different, different, okay? I mean if I just do it and I don't make them different, then that should not be a problem. You know, here we're just saying we want any expression that gives us a value for both left to right and right to left evaluation. So quote of anything will give us a value back. So that's not really interesting. What we really want is something that gives us uh, distinct values. Actually, let me go ahead and put the values up there with the expression so we can actually see what the values are. Right, so let's go run that query again. Okay, so we're saying quote of some symbol is going to give us that symbol back for left to right or right to left evaluation. It's the same. But we can add a constraint, a disqualify constraint. We can say we want the right and left values to be distinct. Okay? Um, so we just want to, to infer an expression, some scheme program that when you evaluate left to right gives you a different value than when you evaluate it right to left. Okay? Um, doo, doo, doo. Okay, now one thing about the interpreters that are, is kind of sucky, I'll just tell you this right now, is that you get different, like radically different performance if you evaluate right to left first or left to right first, okay? And I don't actually remember which one is faster. Uh, let me hold it, let me uh, check in my, my uh, readme real quick. Uh, I've got a bunch of notes on it. Okay, I think what we want to do is do the left to right one first. And this is unfortunate that, that we, we care about the ordering so much because that's one of the things we don't want to do in Minicanron. I'm hoping that Michael's work on improved search will help us. But anyway, let's just try running this. And it, it, it's going to take, uh, take a few seconds. I think it takes like 18 seconds or something like that to find an answer if I wrote it the right way. Um, but yeah, so now... Now Minicanron is looking at lots and lots of programs. Uh, 
and trying to find one that has different evaluation order left to right and right to left. And uh, so let's give it a few more seconds, see if this works. Uh, hopefully it will. I think I've got the right query. And let's watch the clock here. Spent a lot of time, you know, waiting for Mini Kenrin to come back with some of these things. Uh, the right to left interpreter is not very fast for, for various technical reasons. Um, so, so sometimes you do have to wait a while. All right. Let me just make sure query right while we're waiting. Mm -hmm. I think that's right. Yeah, it looks like it looks like you always want the left to right coming first. All right. So I thought this took like 18 seconds. I think it's been longer than that. Uh, curry two directions. All right. Now the other possibility is that. Whoops. Is that uh, well? Let's let that run. Let me just look at the interpreters also, at that interpreter, and uh, make sure I don't have any language forms in there that shouldn't be there, because otherwise that will speed things up or slow things down. So, okay, we got cons about, uh, removed of both of those. That's the other thing I found is that you know having different um, uh, different language forms can really change how long it takes to to run these queries. So, hmm. All right, so that's already taking longer than I thought it would. Uh, just let it run for for another little bit. Um, hmm. All right, if that has trouble, there's another test we can try running. I think I think I've got everything set up right. Uh, yeah. Well. Uh, I might kick off another query in a minute if this if this doesn't come back in a second. I thought it was about 18 seconds. Maybe there's something I'm messing up. Are you sure you loaded the right interpreter? That's a good question. If I loaded the wrong interpreter, that would be a problem. Uh, curry two directions, no shadowing. I think that's right. Curry two directions, no shadowing. Uh... Yeah, that would actually be a problem, wouldn't it? I think that's it. Let me just look up here. Now there is one possibility. There's there's one possibility that the fast answer actually requires uh, cons. Oh, maybe it does. Maybe I commented out the language form that makes us fast. I'm not sure. I mean, relatively fast. Um, yeah, let me just check real quick. Uh, if this doesn't come back in a second, uh, I will try another query that I think I think this interpreter is like set up for right now. So, well, this is the sort of thing I've been. Oh, uh, maybe that is problem. No, I think that should be right. Hmm. Oh, whoa, it takes... Uh, curry two directions. This is the no shadowing two directions. Left to right. Uh, I think this one was actually taking like 92 seconds. It doesn't look like it's using cons. So uh, let's just let it run for a few more seconds. If it's... Um, not sure why it's running, running so slow. I don't know if it has to do with uh, doing the Skype and stuff like that, too. Shouldn't be. This is a multi-core machine. All right. Well, if that doesn't work, uh, then we can try some other ones. Yeah, all right. I'm getting tired of waiting for that. So uh, I'll have to go back and, and play with that some more. Um, it is the case that if you make a little tiny change to this interpreter, like it is not happy. It's very, very fragile, which has not been so fun. But I think, OK, so let me try uh, try this. And this one actually was a different interpreter. Hmm. Maybe I have to be careful. Maybe I do have the wrong interpreter. 
All right, let me try this one. It may be... Uh, let me try one more. If not, I might have to switch interpreters. I might. You might be right, Michael. I might have the wrong one. Let me try this one real quick. Right. Put that. I don't know why this is taking so long. Let me try this one. Maybe this is the one that the one that comes back faster. How long does this take? That one. Sorry. Okay. So this is the one that comes back in like 18 seconds. I see. The other one actually come, takes longer to come back. So. So I guess maybe I shouldn't have expected that one to come back so fast. This one, I think, will come back faster if I didn't mess thing up. Oh, this one uses cons. Oh, dear. All right. One more thing. Let's see. Why did I comment up cons? Am I just being stupid or did I load the wrong file? Okay, I think I actually need cons. I don't know why I commented on cons. I think I need cons. Uh, yeah. All right, let me... Uh, I, I guess I have the wrong language right now. I don't know why it's coming out cons. Maybe I was trying to play with something else, but let's get back in there. Press again. Yeah, if you don't have the right language forms, it's just not going to come back. That's the halting problem for you. Okay, so let's try this again. See if this comes back. Whoa! 900 milliseconds. Huh. That's what you're reporting to read me. Yeah. Okay, well, that's cool. Really? All right. Okay, so here we get you. Um, okay, and that's that's in Vicari scheme. Let's try it in shape scheme, each shape scheme. Uh, same program, and we get lamp, list lamp. Okay, so may, I guess... I guess I just had that problem where I had uh, commented out um, commented out cons. Uh, I don't know if our original query works now. Let me let me try the original query. For some reason, I thought the original query maybe wouldn't work so well, but um, I guess I had the wrong language forms commented out. Must have been playing with something else. Okay, so let me go back to the query I had. Oh, I came back right away, didn't it? Uh, hmm. Okay, 200 milliseconds. Well, that's the difference between uh, an infinite loop and, and not an infinite loop, isn't it? Okay, so let's try this one. Oops, I grabbed the wrong part. Here's the program. Okay. So in Vicari, that's giving us this pair underscore two dot void when we run this in Vicari. Let's see if it's different in shape scheme. Let's... Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's really fast. Okay, so it definitely should have cons uh, uncommented. <laughs> So let me check that in right now. Uh, uncommented cons. If anyone wants to uh, play along, I don't know what I was doing with commenting out cons, but that apparently was not the right thing to do. Okay. Let's go back to the um, to the original query. Okay, so here we go. Yeah, so... Uh, so here is when we were trying to infer, just trying to find an expression that gives us... Whoops, got to load the, the interpreters. Okay. Oops. Uh, we were just trying to find an expression that evaluates differently with left-to-right versus right-to-left ordering. And, and the expression we found um, 
was this expression. So, so you notice you have a set bang, right? And the set bang is inside of a con, so it's in basically argument position in an application. Uh, and that's how we got the different behavior. And the other query we tried was a little bit different. Instead of asking for an expression that can give us any values back, we gave a specific values we wanted to find. We wanted to find the list U, and we wanted to find the list lamp. It's like, go ahead and give us that, uh, that answer. Okay, and we got, we got back a program that does, a, does that for us. Now, uh, what I would really like to be able to do is say, I want a program that gives me either I love you or I love lamp, depending on how you evaluate it. And before, and maybe I'd mess something up, before I was, I was seeing a really massive slowdown as soon as I even put a little bit of additional structure. So let's see, before that took 9.3, uh, or 930 milliseconds. Um, see, if, see how fast this version is. So I'm trying to build up this list, I love you. Uh, but I think I was finding, well, maybe that's, that's kind of stupid. Let me, let me actually do it without the dot. I'll let this run for a minute. Um, what I was noticing is that there was significant slowdown every time I wanted to add something. Okay, so that took three seconds. That's actually not bad. Huh, I must have been doing something different that was stupid. Uh, but you could notice, that, like, it takes ten times as long as, well, as soon as I add the love part. And this might take uh, ten times longer, too. So this, this might, you know, take... Uh, take half a, a minute or more um, to, to infer the, the longer list. Um, the nice thing is this query is very direct, but I also was playing around with a different style of query. Okay, let's come back in 16, 16 seconds. Actually, that's not bad. Huh, huh. I did not expect that. I, I'll, I'll be honest with you all. I felt that that was not going to come back. Um, I thought I was going to have to use something very different in order to make this work. So I'm actually going to add this to the readme. Mm -hmm. oh, so bizarre. Well, so much for my intuition. Uh, I must have changed something else about that. Or I was just using the wrong version of stuff, <laughs> which is possible. All right, so I'm going to update my readme again. All right, so let's let's actually find out if our expression works the way we want. Uh, so let's try it in Vicari. It gives us the list I love you. Let's try it in uh, Shade Scheme. Hate Shade Scheme. And it says I love Lamp. There we go. Okay. That actually was kind of cool. So we were able to infer a, a scheme program that gives us different answers back um, depending on the evaluation order. So that's uh, that's kind of neat. Okay, so... Okay, that was much faster than I thought it was going to be. I can show you all uh, another way I was writing that query. Oh, what is LAMP? Why I love LAMP? It's from Anchorman. Uh, I love lamp. Anyway, it's a little anchor man joke. Uh, yeah, so there we go. It took, took about 16 seconds to infer it. Um, now I have another way to do this query and might write, run really fast now. So the other, when I was playing around with this the other night, something was different about the interpreter. I'm not exactly sure what it was, but it was taking way longer to come back with these answers. Okay, so... I think it was taking, um, I mean, I was not able to infer the I love lamp versus I love you stuff. It just didn't come back directly. So what I came up with was a different way to try to build up the answers. And I'm going to show you that query because the query actually has some interesting structure. And it made me think that um, maybe there's a way to, uh, to use this approach for program synthesis because, you know, I'm, Ultimately, I'm interested in using these techniques to try to do real program synthesis. Uh, it feels like, you know, I mean, this is a form of program synthesis, right? We just synthesize a, a scheme program 
that has specific behavior. It either gives you I love you or I love lamp. Right? We just gave, we just wrote down the mathematical specification, and Mini Camden found it for us. Right? Uh, so that is a form of program synthesis. But I would like to push this a lot further. I mean, it's already pretty neat, but but I want to be able to handle bigger programs. Right? And and you can see that you know even making the list slightly longer made the the query come back way slower instead of you know a couple hundred milliseconds it was taking like 16 seconds right so um, that part wasn't so great uh, Orchid said I guess many Canron is essentially brute forcing it yeah it's doing too much brute forcing you know I think it is cutting off the search in some cases but um, it's definitely doing way more work than it should and that's something that you know Michael's work on the search is trying to to avoid doing as much brute force work because uh, right now the search is kind of dumb. The other thing is, you know, as a human, when I look at this query, you know, if I go back to the original query, right, I can see that the I love parts are the same, right? It's only the you and the lamp part that's actually interesting, right? So, uh, so when I run this query, what I really want to do is, you know, kind of pull out the love or the you and the lamp part, figure out what the difference is there. Oops, I got to load the thing. Um, go back to the party. <laughs> yeah. So, so this thing that takes, you know, 900 milliseconds, that's really the core of this inference problem, right? The I love part is the same in both, so it's it's unfortunate that adding the same part of the expression to to both the uh, to both of these queries slows it down so much. Um, you know, it, it makes it something like 16 times slower just to add the I love part, even though that part is completely boring, right? And I think there are different ways to kind of factor out the fact that we have um, you know this this shared structure between the two. Um, but I was playing around with one way at doing it. I'm sure it's not the only way, but I'll see if I can show you that. Uh, Peter asks, isn't this the time when we need tabling? And that's a good question. I mean, I think I think the tabling probably, probably would give you benefit in this case. But even tabling, in some sense, seems like an overkill. So if, if people aren't familiar with tabling, Tabling is like a memoization or caching where you you basically cache or remember the previous uh, computations. And in this case, that would probably help. Uh, I'm not sure if it would help you completely, but it would, it would definitely help to at least some extent. Uh, one of the trade-offs is that you're, you're trading time uh, for, for memory. You use a lot more memory when tabling. So... You know, it may be that makes it faster, but as your queries get bigger, I mean, I could just keep making this list longer and longer, right? You know, and uh, you might run out of memory with the tabling before you find the answer. I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe it'd be okay. Uh, the other problem right now is our tabling implementation doesn't support the constraints, like just quality constraints and so forth, that we're using in our interpreter. And there, there are kind of ways around that. They're kind of awkward, but... Um, I think it would also be interesting to combine a couple of these techniques with the tabling. Uh, but, but anyway, I, I was coming up with sort of just the human observation that a human, without using tabling, you can just recognize that the I love you parts really are the same. Okay? So it's silly in some sense to, to spend a lot of time, and, and even the tabling, like I said, has a downside in terms of both the implementation, you have to have an implementation that supports tabling, and also you have to, you know, there's a memory trade-off. Um, but it's, it's not really an interesting query in some sense, except for the you and the lamp part. So maybe you can factor those out. Okay, maybe you can factor those out. Uh, so let me, uh, let me bring up what I had. Uh, duh, duh, duh. Uh, Peter said, but once a solution is found for the left to right, it would be just reuse for right to left, right? Um, that is... Uh, well, actually, 
I'm not sure it would be reused for right to left because you would probably have to table those interpreters separately. Um, some of some of the tabling might be the same, but you actually have to be careful because you don't want left to right interpreter and right to left to give the right to give the same values in every case. So, so my guess is you would have to table the interpreters separately. Uh, at least that's my initial intuition. But that's a good question. I don't know. I, I think it's definitely worth playing around with the tabling to try to see. I mean, maybe tabling just gives you this for free, and that would be really cool. Um, but in any case, I mean, and that is something I'd definitely like to explore. Having a tabling system that handles constraints would be awesome. It would be really, really awesome if anyone wants to play around with it. That would be so awesome. I can't even tell you how awesome it would be. But I don't have that right now. So I came up with another way, which is kind of like a cheat in some sense. But I think there might be an interesting essence to this. And I also don't think it's... Uh, I think what I came up with isn't necessarily um, in place of tabling. Maybe it would work with tabling. So I think it's maybe a somewhat orthogonal approach to tabling. Okay. Um, and, you know, this is it's kind of crude, uh, but... I think it also shows something interesting. So let me see if I can pull this out. Uh, all right, see if this query runs. All right, now here's a nice big query for you. See if this runs. Okay. So here it came back in 1.3 seconds instead of 16 seconds or whatever. Now I've got this big query, which looks weird. It's kind of ugly. Um, but we can maybe take a look at what the query does and try to understand what the query is doing. And uh, maybe, you know, I think there's an idea in the query that might be uh, worth exploring more. I'm not sure. Um, the idea of the query, once again, is that the I love part of this query is not interesting. Okay, we want to factor that out. So here we've got the I love. And obviously a special case this is a human, but it may be possible to, to automate this and especially if you put her down the list and you know saw that the I part was shared, then the love part was shared, you know, maybe you could break it down up in a couple parts. But the idea is that there's basically a tricky part of the expression or the value you're trying to come up with and a non-tricky part, the boring part. So the boring part is the I love part in the prefix, and then there's a tricky part at the end. Okay, And we have different tricky values, a left tricky value and a right tricky value. We're saying the left tricky value we want to be the list U, and the right tricky value we want to be the list lamp. And what, you know, sort of, sort of the real queries are these two queries where we're actually going to infer those tricky values. We want a tricky expression, the same tricky expression, to infer both the left and right tricky tricky values. Um, and once we have the tricky expression, so this is, this is, you know, up here we're going to get the tricky expression, and that's kind of the, the real query, right? That, that's the one that was taking us 900 milliseconds or whatever to get. But once we have the tricky expression, the rest of it is is very straightforward and shouldn't take much time. So th this is all to try to to uh, get away from that exponential growth in running time as we make the list longer, um, which in some sense is stupid. It shouldn't shouldn't grow quickly. It should be uh, pretty easy. And like I said, this is somewhat different approach than tabling. Um, it's you know this is using cleverness more than tabling in some sense. The tabling has its own way of recognizing the shared structure. Okay, so the idea here is, and this once again is, is um, inspired by Michael Valentine's observation that we can write append in scheme, right? And then based on that, I was showing off in the uh, previous Hangouts how we can do things like write queries within the, you know, if we have a let rec defining append in scheme, then we can write a query, uh, say, to generate a quine or to generate the list I love you. We can write those queries where we have fresh logic variables in the context, in the body of the let rec that defines append, and now the relational interpreter will know about the definition of append, and we'll be able to use that in the answers, which is really cool. Uh, so the idea is we want to use that trick. We take the tricky expression, and now we're going to essentially let bind it, 
I mean, we don't have let in this interpreter. It might, it'd probably be read more easily as a let. So basically, this is saying let tricky expression, uh, you know, be comma tricky expression, that expression we just defined. Right, so and then within the body of the let, now we're going to put in, you know, kind of kind of our real query, which is we want to infer. Sorry, actually, it's going to be a uh, full expert, I believe. A uh, full expert. Full expert. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's tricky. Ah, okay. Context expert. There we go. That's right. And we want that expression to give us, you know, this value. The uh, the I love the whole I love you expression. So the idea is that we're essentially going to do a let binding in scheme uh, for the tricky expression. And then be able to do a simp you know, infer a simpler expression that that if it wants to, can use the tricky expression, and then you know use that to infer a, a, a value that already has the tricky value that we did for the inference problem. So the idea is that we're trying to break this bigger inference problem down to a smaller inference problem, and then use this trick that where we can actually sort of dynamically generate scheme code and then. Uh, run a subquery in the context of that scheme code we've inferred to make the inference problem simpler. So that's basically what we're doing in this query, and that's why it comes back in 1.6 seconds instead of 16 seconds or whatever it is, right? Um, so we're trying to cut off that exponential growth just because we can take advantage of the fact we have some sharing there. Okay? So, so I think this is actually an interesting query. It shows off a couple of different ideas. Uh, and I don't know how how well we could push this or how far we could push it. Obviously, part of it depends on the fact that we have this shared prefix, the I love part, right? I mean, there's there's some uh, some intuition from a human standpoint that we can do some sharing there, but it may be possible to automate this more. Now, what like Peter said, it would be very interesting to see how tabling worked, if tabling could give us um, also like a big boost but you might even want to do both. I mean, if you're if you're trying to do a serious inference problem or some serious code synthesis, right? It's all about, to some extent, like how big an expression can you infer? And because the problem is inherently exponential, you really need all the help you can get. So, um, you know, tricks like this might be quite useful in addition to things like tabling. Um, all right, so Orchid says, instead of generating direct style scheme code with effects, what about generating some pure code in monadic style? Maybe it would be more efficient. Oh, the unspecified behavior only comes from direct style. Yeah, that's right. So um, so the unspecified behavior is, is something you can only see when you have effects in your program. Now, what you mentioned about generating pure code in monadic style uh, that's an interesting question. What, one thing that is kind of related, a related thought, is something that Brian Massenbrook uh, tweeted about yesterday when I showed some of this code to uh, Michael Bernstein. He, was, he asked if it would be possible to infer programs that were equivalent to the side effecting version but didn't actually use side effects. Um, so let's uh, maybe maybe try that. So I mean that should be in some sense it should be simple. Um, so, so here we have you know from left to right evaluation we want I love you right, and we we already saw that we got back this program that had something and because we want different behavior right, um, but. Say we say we notice this property that we have the scheme expression with the set bang in it, and we want to get rid of the set bang. Let's say, right? Uh, or or we notice that this program has different behavior from left to right or right to left, and you know so so we end up this program that has set bang in it, but maybe we want to do the equivalent without the set bang. Well, you know 
if we only want the left to right version, we can actually write a query like this, absento sepang in the expression. And now we're saying that that expression can't use sepang at all, but it still has to produce I love you. And, you know, obviously it's going to find that pretty quickly. We'll probably do like 10, 10 of those uh, pretty quickly. Yeah, so um, I don't know if there's anything interesting there or not. You know, uh, th there's this idea that, and you could do the same thing with right to left evaluation, that um, you can kind of un, uh, unaffect your code maybe. If you found some, or if you have some code that has setbangs or mutations in it, that you can just restrict the language of the interpreter. And obviously we could have done this in different ways. Instead of doing that uh, uh, absento constraint, we could have we could have used uh, we, we could have changed the interpreter's language itself by commenting out setbang or something like that. But um, is there anything interesting there from the standpoint of like re repairing code maybe or or taking effectful code in general and and removing the effects to get the same value back? Obviously, if we had a function that had setbang and took any argument, repairing that is going to be far trickier because generally it's going to be undecidable. Um, we could probably repair some of the problem, uh, some of the cases, but not in general. Um, but anyway, I wonder if there's any interesting problems to be explored in that space. Uh, uh, Michael Valentine says PD has mentioned black box synthesis. This seems similar. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think it is similar in a way. I mean, we're we're saying what the uh, I mean, this is very similar to, like, example-based synthesis, right? I mean, this is basically a form of example-based synthesis. Um, and Michael asks, can we do better by having the hint of the code using setbang than we would with just the output or just the examples? Uh, okay, so that's an interesting question. Like, so if you knew... So if you were starting with the code that used setbang could you then take advantage of that code to try to sort of differentially repair it and say that most of the code is probably going to be the same, so we so our inference problem is simpler maybe? Uh, I don't know. That might be a good idea because if nothing else, you know, with example-based synthesis, in general, you can never infer the, you know, you, you don't know that you have the right answer just from the examples because... You know, if I give you 20 examples, you could always come up with code that requires another example, right, to, to be more precise and whatever. So um, so that's an interesting idea. Maybe you start with a setbang version, and then there's some way to use that as, like, a, as a hint or a template or something like that, um, and, and then you can, can infer a version that doesn't have effects. I don't know. I don't know. It seems like there's lots of stuff to, to play around with in this space. Um, and then just going back to this big query, which is kind of ugly, I just think, I don't know, there's something about this query that seems really interesting to me. The, just, just this idea that we can break the query down into sub-inference problems. Like, if you look at the really practical um, program synthesis, work, like uh, Gulani out of Microsoft Research has been doing some interesting work, you know, it all seems to be based on the idea that you have to break the problems down into smaller problems and then build up the answers. So, uh, so, so this idea that we can try to break the inference problem down into smaller inference problems and then build up the answer, uh, build up the answer in parts, I think that general approach um, has a lot of promise, even if it doesn't, even if the queries don't end up looking like this, uh, because because of the exponential growth in the search space, if you can keep your individual queries small, you can do a lot of those queries and build it up, and that's much better than having one big query trying to infer everything at once. Um, so I don't know. It seems like there might be uh, might be some interesting things to play with in that area. Uh, Michael Valentine said, uh, would be more interesting if Mini Cameron controlled the building up of the answer. I agree. I think that might be possible to, to do, actually. Uh, here it's less interesting because you're manually specifying that, but that brings us into meta-interpreters. Sure. I mean, I, I think the real the real point of this, and once again, this is more like in a, an idea to, to jog 
you know, thinking than, than as a practical solution. But if we had, you know, this idea of you have left to right versus right to left interpreters, at a meta language, a meta level, the system could be looking for sharing, right? I mean, I did this by hand, but there's no reason the, the system couldn't break these two queries into multiple queries where it's like saying, hey, look, the cars of those lists are the same. So I can reuse that, or the cutter of the lists are the same. So, you know, try try to break it up and have Mini Canron try to look for sharing wherever it can. I mean, it's basically an exploitation of sharing, right? And I don't, you know, there's no reason to think that that can't be automated. I think. Um, so I think you actually could do an automated system, maybe at the meta level, where where Mini Canron is trying to to find sharing as much as possible to break down the inference problem, because. I mean, ultimately, the problem is, in some sense, is because we don't have a conjunction that's any good, right? So even though there's lots of sharing between the two queries, uh, well, we go back to like this query, right? You know, we've got these two queries that, in some sense, are running in parallel or whatever, metaphorically, but they're not really. Um, we we have this ordering that means the first call is going to get most of the time, um, or well, it's gonna it won't necessarily get most of the time, but it's gonna sort of dominate where the where in the, the search tree answers are looked for. Um, and the first call doesn't yet know that the second call has this sharing, right? So so basically this is this is all an attempt to get around the fact that we don't have a very good search. Um, so you know improving the search might help with this a lot. But if we, you know, if we can't improve the search, or if we can only improve the search a little bit, trying to find ways to exploit the sharing seems really important when uh, when we're doing example-based synthesis. So, um, any ways we can exploit sharing, I think would be would be good. Uh, so, Orchid said maybe uh, something like uh, a cooperate call, like uh, like whoops. Yeah, something like that, where we have sharing between uh, parts of the queries or things like that. Um, then thinking about different ways to try to share information between the queries so that they'll, you know, kind of not be so stupid. Where the first the first query isn't just trying to explore this giant space, even though most of the answers in the first query should be immediately cut off by the second query. That's basically the problem, right? It's like that. Uh, that those two calls that we were looking at, they're not, they're not communicating uh, right away, right? So we've got the, uh, you know, the first query. Basically, when you do the left to right evaluation for expert, you know, expert needs to know that when you do it right to left, it also has to begin with "I love you." I mean, "I love," right? So, uh, if the left to right query had that information and could exploit it up front. It should be able to radically prune the search result or the search tree, but it's uh, it's not really taking advantage of that. Um, yeah, Michael Valentine said, "I'd love to see an implementation of cooperate." Uh, Orchid says, uh, "Where it switches, which query it's working on each time it touches a variable." Uh, Michael said, "We've tried something like that based on breadth first search. Breadth first search is slow because it takes forever to get very deep." And uh, Michael's got this decanron implementation on GitHub. Yeah, so there may be ways to to help the two queries like communicate with each other to to fail faster, or to explore more pr promising parts of the search tree more quickly. I don't know, uh, but we don't really know how to do that. And you know, there's been a lot of work on parallel prologs. Uh, and maybe some of the parallel prolog systems, you know, uh, have made progress on this. They they have a different model and are doing a different type of search. So, um, I don't even if they have made progress on this, it might be a little difficult to adapt it to Mini Canron. But but I'm not really sure what techniques they have to try to try to make that make that faster. Um, anyway, so. That is the uh, setbang stuff that I've been playing around with. Um, yeah, Michael, do you want to talk about decanron? 
I guess before we get into that, are there any questions or comments about the Sepang, Sepang stuff? Uh, okay, Orchid thought is really cool. Um, I think it's fun to play with. The interpreters are a little, a little bit of a pain uh, to, to write. I, I've learned a lot about them, but you know, it's uh, they feel kind of fragile right now. But on the other hand, to be fair, you know, over the last like three or four days, I'm playing around with this, made a lot of progress on it, so. I don't know that any of the problems are really insurmountable. Um, it was interesting to see that we could just naively do the query for I love you or I love lamp, and it came back uh, actually relatively quickly, like 16 seconds. Um, so having tabling, you know, uh, especially if you had a machine, you know, if you ran this on a machine that had a terabyte of RAM, which you can get now, um, maybe that's fine. Maybe you could just use tabling just fine. You know, I, I would love to. See, the other thing you could do is you could um, you could parallelize this at a gross level pretty easily, breaking up the top level search. So on like a six, you know, you can get a 16 core machine with a, a terabyte of RAM. It's not that expensive anymore. You know, so uh, it'd be really interesting to see what sort of performance benefits you could get from the parallelize, parallelization at the top level of the search, and with just lots and lots of RAM and lots of tabling. It may be that you could get that, you know, answer back and uh, extremely quickly. So I wouldn't be surprised if that were the case. It'd be it'd be neat to play around with that more. But I also think you know having a much better search would make a make a huge difference as as well as many optimizations that we're not currently doing. Um, like I said, it's funny to think of programs that do different things depending on who runs it. Yeah, that's true, and and that might be you know fun from a fuzzing standpoint. I think it just brings up lots of interesting issues also, like fun things that you can do with a relational interpreter. So it's, uh, you know, just, just gives you things to think about more. Um, so anyway, uh, so surprisingly, that ran much better than I thought it would. I, I, I thought it was way too slow to run the I love you stuff. <laughs> OK, well, I must have changed. I must have done something wrong. Uh, Speaking of fuzzing, did you hear about American fuzzy lop? I saw something about that in like Hacker News or something like that. What is that? Generate JPEGs from scratch. Uh, American fuzzy lop. I, it can, it's a genetic algorithm based fuzzer. It sort of watches the states a program goes through when fed input. Hmm. So sort of like a machine learning-y type thing. Uses that to work out weird inputs to give it, to make it explore even more states. It instruments the source code and tries to reach all branches by genetic algorithm search. So like in call execution? Hmm. You know, that would be really interesting to try with uh, the mini camera stuff, right? I mean, that would be, uh, that would be fun. It would be fun to do this with uh, Mini Canron and see what sort of weird weird patterns you know, could be inferred. Uh, Orca says, it seems really close to what you're doing with relational interpreters, though. If I can create JPEGs from nothing, a similar idea might be able to generate complex programs. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that's, that's what we're hoping for with something like Prop Canron, but maybe this approach would give us you know, different benefits. I mean, I think the idea of... So we're taking the symbolic approach where you have the semantics baked in, but combining it with like machine learning or you know like probabilistic inference or genetic algorithms or neural networks or something like that could be an extremely powerful technique. You know, sort sort of combining the symbolic uh, inference with the probabilistic inference, I think, is really really neat. Uh, Dana says, I think it's tricky because AFL targets the C memory model and gets in the CESK machine issues. Sure, sure, that could be tricky. But I think the general idea, you know, maybe, maybe looking at it at a higher level, like, you know, what would happen if you applied genetic algorithms to try to learn, you know, okay, so one of the problems we have in Mini Canron is that if you want to generate interesting answers, like say, say for example, I want to generate a million programs that evaluate to I love you. Right, million scheme programs have I to I love you, which I've done. Uh, turns out almost all of those answers are boring. Almost every single answer, 
you know, it's like lambda x, lambda y, lambda z, quote, I love you, you know, applied to a bunch of nonsense arguments. So that's not a very interesting answer, right? If you're going to have all these lambdas and applications, you want them to be involved somehow in building up the answer. So it would be interesting to be able to have some sort of measure or something like that that explains what an interesting answer looks like, or here's a bunch of examples of interesting answers, and you could use that to help drive where in the search uh, Mini is looking to try to find find interesting answers or to find answers that have that those characteristics. You know, stuff like that I think would be neat. Uh, okay. All right. Cool, cool, cool. All right, so Michael, do you want to talk about the decanera stuff? Sure. All right. So uh, I guess the idea was to go for something a little more like bread for search because that would, in theory, be more fair. And if you, you know, take a step in one conjunction, you want to be able to you want you want to be fairly alternating between the conjunctions. And kind of the very fairest is a is a bread for search over the tree. Um, and then you know we tried something like that and it was horribly slow because you kind of ex explode the state space with bit first search, right? It's very exponential. Um, whereas Mini Kenron's normal search, you know, if you have a conjunction of two things, um, the very first substitution produced by the first conjunct, um, you're going to spend half the time in the second conjunct working with that first substitution from the first conjunct. Um, so the answers you get from the first conjunct get kind of exponentially less time as they go on, and that means that you end up going very deep in the tree for relatively few answers, but um, it seems like that gets you to answers a lot more quickly. Um, so some things we tried to make bread for search a little faster. So basically what we're doing is we're um, doing, so, so we're explicitly representing the tree instead of using streams. Um, and so we have nodes in the tree for conjunctions and disjunctions. Um, and as we kind of process nodes, we reduce up to kind of a top-level node. Um, so our top-level node, we start out and we go take any unifications, and when we apply a unification, we just go ahead and do it. When we find a fresh, so a, uh, a conjunction, um, you know, we nest nested down inside another conjunction. We just go inside there and kind of do things immediately. There's no delay there. And the only time when we kind of delay or move on to something else is when we get to where we basically only have a list of condies left in a conjunction. So we've got, you know, fresh, one condi, another condi, you know, maybe more than two. Um, and that is kind of the reduced state. So from there, you can distribute and kind of move on from there. Um, so it's just kind of a, a Cartesian product of all possible uh, all possible combinations of the Condi branches. Um, and one way to kind of optimize that is to look at the Condi branches before you distribute them and say, OK, well, even in the substitution I currently have, before I combine it with any of the other condies in this conjunction, this particular um, this particular branch of the condi is not satisfiable. So if that's the case, then I can just completely throw it away. I don't have to distribute it in this Cartesian product uh, with the other ones. Um, and if I can get to the point where I've you know, thrown out all of the possible branches for one of these condies inside of a fresh, then I know that the fresh as a whole is not satisfied. Um, so it means that sometimes I can kind of look ahead and realize that no matter how I combine these things, uh, nothing's ever going to work out. Um, and one other thing you can do is you can say, okay, well, if there's only one branch left, then again, kind of don't wait to distribute it, you know, even if they're kind of condies that are textually earlier. If there's only one branch left, you know, that's going to have to be true. So we're going to go ahead and evaluate that one branch. Um, so in Prolog, I think there's 
uh, we found something called you know determinant space search order. So that's kind of a place where the can, the, the branch of the disjunction you take is determined. There's only one that will work given the current substitution. And so you can kind of go ahead and take it. Um, and combining those things together, you uh, you get a, you know, we've gotten to breadth for search, and I can generate, like, one quine in 30 seconds. Um, so previously, without that determinants-based addition, I wasn't able to generate quines at all. Um, so it seems like it's, you know, it's a lot slower than Mini Cameron's normal search right now because there's a lot of overhead and you're exploding the state space with this this really wide kind of breadth for search. Um, but you do get better divergence behavior on particular queries where right now Mini Cameron's just going to go through and try an infinite number of possibilities and then the next conjunct is just going to say no to every one of them. And so right now Mini Cameron will diverge there and uh, this kind of bread for search strategy can finitely fail. So, so do you think the bread for search strategy with the determinancy stuff and also with the um, sort of the learning uh, that we're talking about doing that from the, the SMT solver or SAT solver stuff, the back jumping, do you think the back jumping could, could make the bread for search actually practical? So the bread for search is already doing back jumping in effect. Uh, so the effect of back jumping is realizing when a unification that you're going to do at, or so so in back jumping you're realizing the unification you've just done is caused by something kind of way back, right? What we're doing in the breadth for search because we're filtering the branches of the condes before we ever get to that unification kind of for real in the distributed kind of product, we are filtering the branches and and applying that unification and also recognizing early that given the substitution we currently have, this is never going to work. So I'm not sure. I'd have to think about it more, but so far, I think we get most of the benefit of something like back jumping. Um, you know, that's already kind of baked into the first search strategy we're trying. So what's interesting is trying to go back to the kind of biased mini Cameron kind of interleaving search, which has a lot less overhead, and saying, can we, with low overhead, add this back jumping and get some of the benefit that we would from the bread for search as far as divergence and you know cutting off the search tree in a lot of places? Can we get that with a, a much smaller overhead? What about a depth first search with the back jumping? Do you think that would be sufficient to... Um, handle some of these mini Cameron queries that would normally diverge with uh, depth first search? You know, could we do things like quines and stuff like that using depth first search with back jumping? Um, so it gives you another possible source of divergence. It means that your ordering of clauses is capable of causing divergence now. Um, so if we were careful about ordering the clauses in the relational interpreter such that um, all of them that kind of had a finite end, like the var clause was first, right? And, and you know, the, uh, the, the cons clause was later, right? Because you can just keep consing a fresh variable on the front of a list forever, right? Um, and so your, your depth for search, if you had your clauses in the wrong order, might always just choose to cons a fresh variable on the front and do it again and do it again and do it again. And because you're in depth for search, that never kind of never try anything else, whereas with Mini Cameron's interleaving search, we try other things. So I think we should try and retain Mini Cameron's interleaving search, um, but figure out a way to add back jumping into that. I think that'd be more interesting. Very interesting. Yeah, so it'd be, it'd be cool to see what comes to the better search. I think better search is something that would potentially make the biggest possible um, improvement to performance for Mini Cameron and make a lot of these programs that are right now kind of interesting, but not very practical, and maybe make them more, much more practical. That, so, and I think, yeah, go ahead. I think the most interesting kind of beyond the search that we're talking about right now, but interesting idea that you've mentioned, is for something like example-based synthesis, where you're trying to produce a single program, but with multiple, you know, takes different inputs, different outputs, right, as your example. Um, being able to recognize that, well, you can run kind of one instance of the interpreter 
on one kind of potential program until there's some kind of conditional or whatever inside that program that makes it potentially do different things depending on the input. But until you get to that point, you should just really have to really just have to run kind of one instance of it along. And I don't really know of a way to do that in Mini Canon right now, even if with a better search, it wouldn't do that. And so that's kind of an interesting idea that seems like it it aligns with what you were showing with the left to right, right to left kind of stuff, where you've got, you know, one program and the interesting part where something is different, you know, hasn't come up yet, you should really just you know, be running one instance of an interpreter or something. Yeah, so, so there's a really interesting paper uh, came out maybe a year or so ago by uh, Golani and and uh, and others from Microsoft Research and I think University of Washington maybe. Um, and it's on example-based program synthesis for recursive programs. And the idea there is that you have like a list of input uh, arguments uh, or input values to a program you're trying to synthesize and a list of output values. And and what you try to do is synthesize bottom-up uh, the smallest expression. You start, start with, you know, so, so you have a whole language, but you don't have if in it. Okay, You don't have if in your language. You don't have any conditionals in your language. That's really critical. And what you try to do is you try to synthesize tiny expressions bottom-up with the smallest possible expression you can you can get that satisfies some, but maybe not all, of the input-output pairs, the examples. So, you know, if you're trying to, uh, say, synthesize the square function, let's say, an input, one input would be 1, and the output would be 1. One input, input would be 0, and the output is 0. One input would be 2, and the output is 4, or something like that. The idea is that you try to synthesize these tiny little uh, snippets of, say, scheme code that will satisfy some of the input-output pairs, but not all of them. And if you can only synthesize part of, you know, uh, expressions that will solve part of these uh, input-output pair examples, that means that maybe you synthesize the base case, or maybe you synthesize part of a recursive call, and then you, you introduce ifs very carefully. You introduce conditionals extremely carefully in a very controlled way to allow you to, to, to branch between you know, base cases and recursive cases and stuff like that. So, so the, the idea of the Galwani approach is, is the conditionals that cause problems, and you want to be able to, to do program inference that doesn't handle all of the input-output examples simultaneously, but can handle some of them. And then you build up the big program from these pieces by introducing if in different ways. So, so that'd be really interesting to see if we could do something similar in spirit to that in, in Mini Canron. And, you know, it, once again, it's all based on the idea of trying to break the inference problem into little tiny sub-inference problems and then building it up instead of trying to infer the whole program, which is, which is way more computationally expensive. Um, so, so yeah, and, and once again, you have this idea that maybe you could have multiple queries running independently. They're each trying to synthesize their own little piece, and you know, can try to get us away from some of these search problems that we're running into. Well, yeah, thank you, Michael. That's, uh, that's interesting. And say, um, so Michael says... Uh, We'll push latest work to the uh, D Canon repo soon uh, for following determinate branches immediately. Very neat. Hopefully that will work out. Uh, the back jumping that'd be that'd be pretty awesome. So back jumping that'd be really cool. Tabling that handled constraints really cool. Uh, Ambrose. Do you want to explain to us a little bit about how the um, uh, how your your work on type bracket and type closure works? Um, yeah, I was, uh, yeah. So what I've been trying to do just now is to kind of generate a bunch of propositions that I want um, a constraint solver to solve about a program, but um, my uh, uh, do a project in an hour uh, <laughs> skills are lacking, but I'll, I'll show you what I've done. Hang on. How does Hangout work? Uh, screen share. 
And, and I'd also be use uh, be interested in just learning more about like the type racket approach in general because I don't I don't think I really understand it that well. Like, is that all at the macro level? Um. So. Macros aren't exactly uh, very crucial to the uh, to the type inference. So w what actually happens is that um, type bracket first macro expands out your entire program, and then operates on the expansion, and doesn't actually try to assign any sort of types to the macros. So the only point where um, type bracket talks to the macro system is in the the hash lang form, I think, when it's hash lang type racket, it, it kind of, it lets type racket um, kind of hook into the macro expansion, so then it, it, it gets all the code, does its thing, and then can generate some optimizations that it can then plug back in. So that's about the extent that the macro expansion gets involved. Um, with typed closure, it's like uh, a linter, basically. So Someone, you have to call it explicitly and give it the code, and then it it's just kind of throws the code away. So, yeah, uh, the, the underlying approach uh, for type checking is called occurrence typing, and it's uh, it's basically generating a um, a bunch of, of propositions, like propositions that say uh, the the local x is of type symbol, the local y is not of type nil. For example, yeah, and it, the basic approach is that it, it it eagerly mashes them all together. As you might get to a, where would it happen? I don't know. Particular places like let bindings, or let me think. No, so if is where you learn things. So say you're in a uh, a function and you're checking the body. Uh, so the, the function might take some A that's either nil or a symbol, or a false or a symbol, let's say we're in type bracket. So when you get to an if expression, say you're testing that argument, like if we go down the then branch, we know it's not false. Uh, if we go down the else branch, we know it is false. So in each of those branches, that's where we combine these propositions to, uh, to, to get... Uh, more accurate types, and these propositions can talk about paths down types. So, say our um, the the, uh, the variable that we're testing is a pair, and we look at the we ask if the car of the pair is a symbol. So down the then branch, the the, the proposition that we have that we add to the environment is um, the car of X is a symbol. So uh, it's very much delaying all these things until uh, uh, delegating a lot of work to the constraint solver. Like, do you, do you mind uh, maybe bringing up Racket and show, giving us like a quick demo? Because yeah. I'm having a little trouble. I mean, I'm, I think I've got kind of some of the idea, but I think if I actually saw some examples, it, it would help. Okay. Okay. Uh, is this readable? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, let's say we have a function like this. We're annotating it, uh, and we say if a, then inc a otherwise returns zero. So this function actually returns a a number. So what actually happens when you check this, uh, the first thing we do is we get, we, we see we have a, a lambda. So we're going to have to scope this type in our type checker, uh, sorry, scope the type for A to be associated with uh, union, nil, and, uh, and number. So like what you might do in, in a traditional type system is have like a uh, association list. So say something like A is associated with um, this and like if you had another variable it would be whoops uh, 
let's say. Get another variable, we would add it to the association list like that. So the difference with occurrence typing is that instead of a, a type environment, we have a proposition environment. So we end up with a list of propositions like, so say we're at this point in the program here. So uh, we know that A is a union of nil and number. So we generate a proposition that actually corresponds to that. So I'll use some syntax here. Um, So this proposition is saying the same thing that we express with our um, kind of traditional type environment. Can you uh, bump up the font size a little bit? The uh, some of that dark text on black is might be hard to read in the YouTube video. Thanks. Is that better? Yep. Okay. Uh, so this is the association list, and we have a proposition environment here. So, so yeah, we're in this place in our program. We've, uh, we're starting to check the body and we've scoped the, uh, the variable A. So yeah, we've generated a, uh, a type proposition that claims some things about um, a particular part of our runtime environment. So in this, in this uh, instance, we're, we're claiming things about the local binding A. Uh, that and that is that it is of type union nil and number. Um, so yeah, uh, let's take another step in our program. So uh, at this point, let's say we're here. Uh, we know B is of number, so this is the way we normally do it. But now, what actually happens is that we have uh, in in type bracket, it would be something like this. So B is uh, of type number. Now, so so far, your proposition is just like like a type environment, right? Are there other propositions you're going to have? Yes. Uh, so, uh, at a conditional, uh, what this conditional is actually doing is checking for uh, whether something's equal to false. So the way that we uh, represent that in our proposition environment, say that we're going down the then in, uh, the then branch. What can we assume? Well, we can we can assume that A is not false. So we have a proposition that's a negative proposition, uh, or nil. Okay, let's let's imagine we're in closure. Uh, nil is a false value. Actually, might be easy just to. And just to be clear, this false here is a singleton type of false, uh, that, that just contains false, and uh, yeah. Um, it might okay, be... so, could, uh, so it's not a Boolean. No, it's a, it's a value type, uh, or a singleton type, that contains only false. So its only inhabitant is false. Okay, and is that important? Um... Uh, it's just to... to mm. It's to, it's so you're not going to end up incrementing true, is that the point? Uh, I, I guess I was just explaining that uh, the thing that goes here in a proposition is a type. Like, this isn't a value. This is this is a type that... Um, okay. Yeah, this, this type says that it's either going to be the value false or an instance of number. Um, so... Uh, so what we actually learned down this, this branch here is that A is not false. So we have a... Uh, proposition, uh, a negative type proposition, that uh, A is not false. So let's just ignore this uh, part in the middle for a second. That there's some interesting, uh, we can derive something from this because if we combine these two expressions, uh, these two propositions, we can uh, generate is number. So what actually happens when we uh, type check this expression, uh, we, when we type check A, what A does is it tries to find the most specific type in the proposition environment associated with A. And we've proved that it's a number by our uh, proposition environment, so this type checks. And um, yeah, down the else branch, it, it 
generates a uh, 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 the opposite uh, proposition. So down the else branch, we know that A is definitely false. So if we combine these two things, uh, well, we're done, basically, because this is the most specific thing. Um, yeah. So that's the, uh, the the smallest example I can think of. Uh, so, so could you do that just as easily instead of trying to find the most specific um, value for or proposition for A? Could you just do it by, um, you know, rewriting the entire proposition environment to just have the, you know, is number A and not have two associations for A? Would that? Oh that yeah, I, I guess I'm, here? I'm kind of confusing uh, the the shortcuts we do in the calculus uh, with. Uh, what actually happens in the implementation. In the implementation, this proposition would probably get obliterated. Uh, but in the actual formalism, you know, it says, yeah, subsumption, blah, blah, blah. It just finds the most specific type. So in the real world, this thing would be deleted. Yeah. OK, OK. It, uh, how would you characterize this? Um, how is this related to type state? At one point, I know. Uh, Rust had type state, which I think they removed, but it was sort of you had these uh, check obligations that once you had discharged them, you didn't have to put in your code anymore. So you know, sort of like you know, once you check to see if something is null or not null or whatever, then you can keep. Once you know something is not null, you can take the car of it as many times as you want. You don't have to keep putting null checks in front of it. You know, this as long as you exactly discharge. yeah, this is exactly that. Okay. Yeah. So. Uh, this is exactly, yeah, if this was a union false and a pair, if we tested it and it was a truthy value, then we would generate something that says that the pair is not false. So then, therefore, it's it's fine to take the car of it. OK. So, uh, um, are, are there other sorts of propositions you have, or, th or does this kind of capture the sense of it? I mean, does um, it all kind of feel like this? So, OK. Let's do something a little more interesting. Because I think this would be trivial to write in mini Canon right now. Cool. Uh, so let's say we have a pair. Uh, and we're testing if the car of A is a number. Then we want to increment it, increment the car of A. So let's just start again. So if we're in this part of our code, we know that A is of type any to any. Sorry, uh, a pair of any, any. And uh, this expression here, uh, yeah, the, the way that we determine uh, what the propositions are that we learn is from this expression. So. Uh, every expression has two propositions attached to it. Uh, one is the proposition that's true if the return value is true, and one is the proposition that's true if the return value is false. So if this returns true, then we know the car of A is a number. So the way we represent that is saying that the car of A um, but this is actually a proposition, and is, this is called the then proposition, and this is called the else proposition. So let's say we're checking, um, this is our then branch. Let's say we're checking where our then branch. So we have two propositions now. Uh, because what actually happens is when we go down the then branch, we take the then proposition and then combine it uh, and add it to our proposition environment. So our current proposition environment already has this proposition in it. So let's remember that. And we also have this proposition in it. So the trick here is that we need to combine this information to derive the, the, this. 
Um, and yeah, this is this is about as complicated as it as it gets. Well, this this can type check a, a a ton of programs. If you can do this, if you can take these two propositions and know that A is uh, of this particular type, then that's very useful because now this car of A, uh, you know, we can we can find exactly what the type is, and that's safe to increment. So uh, I think that's also trivial to do in Minikinder. Okay. Um, let me think. Yeah. So I guess the trick will be: what if? Uh, yeah. Well, one of the crucial things about our type inference in type racket is that we have annotations. So there's no kind of global type variables. It's all very localized. Um, so yeah, I guess that's the trick. And that's something that I'm not very experienced with. Uh, so yeah, I would definitely find a small example that's, that has these kinds of annotations that we can use to drive the program. And then, yeah, as we were saying before, then we can replace these with logic variables, like, implicitly, and see how we go. But yeah, that's the basics. OK. Uh, so, so in some sense, are those innies just sort of like two fresh logic variables? I mean, is that sort of like A is mm. pair x, y, where x and y are logic variables? You know, can you no, think this that is way? the top type. This contains all types. It's a concrete type, uh, ground type. Yeah, but I mean, I mean, logic variables are concrete ground types, right? In some sense, right? I mean, you know, they're, they're, like in other words, a logic variable does represent a single concrete ground value. It's just that, you know, if you don't constrain them enough, then they represent more than one. You know, but sort of like you can you can imagine them as you can always ground them to a single ground value, right? So. You know, could could you get away with? Uh, I mean, in this case, mm, well, I mean, you might even want to do a check at the end, saying, "Hey, well, if if they haven't been sufficiently ground, then you fail, or something like that." Um, but I, I wonder if you could get away with being that simplistic in this case and just having having the the car and cutter be just two fresh logic variables. Oh, that's Fair super enough. weird. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> What's weird about that? That's, he's, that's not weird at all. <laughs> as in these, are, uh, well, I've been thinking of any for uh, as the simplest possible thing you could think of. Yeah. Just... Well, logic variable is the simplest possible thing you can think of, right? I don't know. <laughs> uh... I mean, the carve is going to end up being a number, right? Well, so, uh, so you don't know anything about the cutter in this case, right? So is it going to end well, up being like int, comma, any? Is that what the type's going to be for A? But A down the then branch, it will be. Yeah. Well, OK, so. Uh, Let's see. Well, it might help to, to see the propositions for the else branch. Uh, uh, not a number. So it's that down the else branch. So now our anything here is is now a, a number down here and a mm. false down here. So maybe it doesn't look very logic variably. Um. So do those have to be consistent or not? I guess I'm not. Well. Uh, you can learn anything from these branches, but you still need. You, I mean, here we're learning the exact opposite things. So, you know, if if it has to agree with the original logic variable, they're not going to agree because they're contradictory. Well, you just have a con D. I mean, it's not con actually in mini and it's hard to make this. Con I mean, it takes more work to make them contradictory. I think. You make sense. Yes. <laughs> right. I mean, it depends how you want to view the, the, the rule for if, but if you let if just take different paths for the different branches, then I think it's not contradictory at all. Yeah. Anyway, I mean, I feel like Mini Canron could, I think it's definitely worth exploring. I think uh, there's a decent chance Mini Canron could handle a lot of these problems, like, 
pretty easily. I also wouldn't be surprised if there's some things Mini Canary couldn't handle easily. Yeah. But at least the stuff I've seen so far, I feel like probably could could do without much difficulty. Uh, Orchid has a couple questions, by the way. Uh, hang on. In chat. Uh. Uh, I can just read them. Yeah, uh, it's interesting. Sure. Yeah, it's interesting how the uh, types can depend on what path was taken. Would that work for lambda encoding of booleans too? What is what does that mean? Uh, encoding of booleans. Is uh, that like church encoding, Orchid? Or are you talking about something else? Yeah, church encoding of booleans. Uh, church uh, encodings of true and false. Huh. I guess it's I guess it's probably easy to try. Yeah, I I, I don't know. <laughs> All right, there you go, Orchid. You can try that out. And then the other uh, says, oh, if you use a logic variable, you would need copy term, which is non-logical. Maybe. Actually, I don't know that I agree with that. Like we figured out how to do things like uh, polymorphic let for Henley Milner, and we didn't have to use copy term. Uh, there there are various tricks to get around that. Uh, you know, so so one thing you can do is you can have a special environment that uh, you can have polymorphic bindings and non-polymorphic bindings, for example, um, and that all runs backwards. It's all purely relational. So we've done that before. We know we know how to do that. Um, so so yeah, I, I actually don't think you'd need copy term to do any of this stuff. I, I haven't seen anything that scared me so far, but I, I also am not sure I've seen everything of interest, but all the stuff you show me, Ambrose, I think I actually know how to do off th I know how to do all of that off the top of my head, I think. Excellent. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, there, there may be uh, Mini Cadron has this property that often things that look really hard are really straightforward to do in Mini Cadron, but things that look really straightforward to do in other languages are, like, really hard to do in Mini Cadron. <laughs> so, I, I, you know, I'm not declaring victory. I'm just saying that I, I think for the stuff you've shown, we could do that. Awesome. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so yeah. that would be fun to try writing a little inferencer for your, for your type system. Yeah. Um, I don't know. We could try it now if you want. If you want to do a little live coding. Um, if if you want to write some some mini Canron and I tell you what to write, sure. Then I'm totally do that. pumped. Let's do it. Uh, unless anyone else wants to drive, I don't want to. I don't want to deprive anyone else from uh, from learning opportunity. Anyone else want to drive? I mean, I'm happy to do it, but I don't. If anyone else is happy to drive. Also, uh, that's cool too. Anyone? Anyone? I do. All right, Michael, do it. Okay, let me. Get were, were you were you following all that? Do you? Uh... I followed much of it. I might need some hints, but. Okay. Um. So sorry. Let me. I'm gonna stand up for a second because my back's hurting from this chair. Oh. So I guess right, let's copy of mini yeah. Cameron. Yeah, so why don't, you, why don't you bring all that up, and I'm going to get a, a glass of uh, orange juice, and then we'll see if we can write a, uh, a typed racket type inferencer in real time. Yeah. So I think the first thing that we need to do is to give basic values like false and numbers like okay. um, we need to give them their, their propositions for being truthy and falsy and basically for something like a number the then proposition is going to be some sort of unit proposition that just is trivial, and the else proposition is going to be an impossible proposition, so a false, whatever. So those are the two propositions that we might want to start with. I don't know how they're represented or how we'd want to do that, a trivial and impossible proposition. All right. 
All right, everyone's got to stay frosty here. We need everyone's uh, <laughs> everyone's thinking to see if we can pull this off. Okay. So um, I have an empty mini Cameron pilot. Um, can you uh, so the goal in the Oh, yes, that would be useful. Thank you. So, so we've got we've got a language of types, and we have also the kind of the the, the programming language that we're yeah. doing the inference on. Yeah. Um. So when you do something like number ha of the car, could you put a more complex expression than just car in there? You can put an arbitrary expression as long as it's not mutated. So. This okay. completely breaks as soon as you put mutation. So, if yeah. the uh, if the local at the end is mutated, then the entire anything talking about that local uh, goes. So, uh, yeah, uh, the general system you can put any any stream of cars and cutters or s syntax or just anything that you can think of that's immutable. Yeah. So as we're inferring kind of over any expression, we have to kind of build up the true and the true and false types kind of as we go. Uh, yes. So every expression will will know its own true and false propositions. Okay. So yeah, I was I was saying that we should start with the simplest expression. So like let let's say we only have numbers and false in our in our term language. Uh, and uh, a number would have a trivial and impossible proposition for then and else, um, and the opposite for false. Uh, okay, so we could say um, define infer true false types for a term. Yeah. And then split on what the term looks like. And what were the ones you suggested starting with? So uh, maybe just use a cond here uh, because our term is going to be fixed. So let's just uh, let's just go make our terms inputs and uh, yeah, let's start there. <laughs> let's well, I mean, let's let's do it mi the mini Cameron way, tr fully relationally, and, and we'll you know. We'll okay. See if we have so, um, I think it should be a problem. So if it's nil, uh, sorry, if it's false, we need. Um, so we need a way of representing propositions. So I, I uh, yeah. So I don't know what's the best way. Uh, we need propositions that relate um, parts of the environment to types, uh, and we also need propositions that say um, something's trivially true, uh, like the the unit proposition and the impossible proposition. Yes. And uh, can can we model the impossible proposition just as failure? Like, do you actually need to keep going in that case, or do you just fail? I mean, once you know something's impossible, does that mean hey, we just can't type check it, or does it mean you just like somehow relax the yeah, typing rules? Go down a different branch, right? So I guess. Yeah. So if we add the impossible proposition to our proposition proposition environment, that does mean that the current branch is unreachable. But we, yeah, yeah, but we still need a way of of saying that something has an impossible proposition as a, you know, as a then proposition. Why do you, Why do you need to be able to say that? So say we're branching on the value false. Um, so false would have two propositions. Uh, the uh, impossible proposition for being truthy, and the trivial one for being falsy. So uh, when we go down the then branch, we take the impossible proposition, and then we just, you know, we'd abort. Uh, but but I, I'm just saying we just need something that that represents the false, uh, the impossible proposition. Well, uh, we, we may it. not actually need to represent it. So what is the ultimate program that we're trying to write? Are we trying to write a checker? Uh, yes. So if when our checker encounters an if, it uses a logic variable kind of kind of anything uninstantiated, anything we don't actually know about um, about kind of the input to the if expression, 
is a logic variable, and then it can kind of infer circumstances where it would be true and where it would be false. Yeah. And um, in the circumstances, okay. So I guess I guess what we what we need is well. Well, can, can we just represent impossibility as failure, just like fail in that branch? The, the way we use the impossibility of a of a of a proposition. Hmm? Where do we use so so if we if we were to produce the impossible proposition here, what decision do we make based on that later? Um, so we don't go down it, or yeah, exactly. So it, well, why don't we just fail in that branch then? Yeah, that's. Hmm. A, I'm just saying we need need a way of knowing that we have the impossible proposition as one of our propositions. Why That's can't we just Why can't we just fail that branch? Well, let's just try this, and we'll okay. get to the point where. Uh, so maybe we'll write our infer or check function, right? And we'll do a case for values, case for if, and a case for a lambda that we can add our types, and then we'll okay. get to the point where um, this. This might Are we trying to infer a type from a term? Then? Let's just, uh, well, OK, infer, that's a fine name, yeah. I'm trying to be pessimistic as, as possible, and you guys can be more optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> I think mini Cameron works the best if you're, you know, if you're optimistic, because yeah. you, end up, you end up with the right data structures if you kind of start from where you want to be and then fill it in. So. So well, you can imagine my pessimism because I've actually written this, you know, manually. So <laughs> <laughs> that's too hard, though. All, All right. right. So we have a simple a value. So we have false and oh, we could do this with just false and true, I guess. There's some interesting cases. Okay. So just inferring the type of false and true. Yes. Okay. Okay. So if the term is one of those. In those circumstances, what do we do? Uh, so we need to represent the type boolean. So is that just going to be a symbol called bool? Uh, so if it's one of those, let's say that the type is a bool. OK. Uh, That'll do. OK, so this is, yeah, for either of these, we're doing the same. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um. And let's have an if expression. Okay. So unify if uh, condition uh, then and else. So are we going to allow arbitrary expressions as the condition? Like, it, is it, are we just going to make it bool or any for a condition? Uh, is there any reason to restrict it? I don't know. Usually, when we write it, we let any expression go there. Oh, oh okay, that's well, good. Okay, okay. So I guess do we make it? Do we do we require the expression? Are you saying do we require that you only write true or false there, or do we require that the expression must evaluate to a boolean and not to a list or something? Yeah, I'm I'm okay. saying the what truth. types do we admit in the test position and. You can do whatever you want. Let's let's say any or so. We just need to infer some type for the condition, and for now, let's just throw it away. We don't care, but it needs to type check. Okay, so we need to say infer over condition for some type. I don't care what. Let's do bool for now. Okay, I like that better. So okay. And now let's infer the types for both branches. And they both have to be of the type that we currently want. Okay, so infer uh, then to be type and yeah, infer then type infer else type. Um, okay. So so far we're not using anything about the condition, right? To constraint. That's right. And we, we don't have any sort of type environment or proposition environment at this point. Yeah, so we should only need a proposition environment, uh, but we also don't have any ways of introducing local bindings. So 
I think maybe a function or a let. I, I don't know. But we're going to have to have a way to annotate. Oh, uh, we, let's make a lambda. Okay. That, um, I don't know, a one argument lambda that I guess it's easy enough to just put a type uh, annotation. So the, make some syntax up so we can add a, a type to the lambda. Yes, OK. Do, do we need a type for the body or just for the argument coming in? Oh, uh, so just for the argument. Oh. Um. OK. So now we're at the point where we actually need some sort of environment. Okay, um, so it should infer, in addition to trying to infer a term to type, it should be doing that within a... Within some prop and uh, proposition environment. Okay. Yeah. So now we need a way of representing that the arg is of type arg type in a proposition. So... Um, Right, so just an association list. Uh, no, well, so we have two types of propositions. We have a, a positive one and a negative one. So uh, I, I call them type prop and not type prop. It takes a type and some part of the environment, like a local binding with cars and cutters and stuff. So I'm not sure what the best way of. All right. So can you explain that again? So we need to represent our propositions now. So um, there's there are two types of propositions that are interesting. There's one that that claims positive type information and one that claims negative type information. So like okay. something could say uh, a is of type number and something could say a is not of type number. So we need ways of storing that information in a proposition. Okay. So what happens then is when we check the body, we have the uh, in a lambda it's easy. We just say a uh, the arg is of type arg type. So that's what we're going to put into into our prop n when we check the body. Okay. So choose uh, some representation, a list or whatever. Uh, yeah, so so could we have something like an association list of a maps to not bool and b maps to bool. Sounds great. Cool. So we need to extend that with the knowledge that arg is of type arg type here? Correct. Okay. So new prop n or prop n hatch. Actually, let's switch the positions of a and n. Once we add cars and kudas, it's nice to just be able to put it at the end. So, sorry, can you switch? Sorry, the... uh, on line 26, um, just switch the positions in our A-list. Uh, because re remember our propositions, this, isn't a, this is not an A-list. This is a, um, a, you can put extra paths down on the right-hand side. Okay, so we're not, yeah, we're not going to be looking up A? Exactly. Okay. We're going to have a rule when we check variables that proves that um, you know, the current variable is of a specific type that, that does some sort of constraint solving in the proposition environment. Okay. All right. Um, so, uh, what, yeah, okay. You've got it. So we're going to associate uh, our type with uh, arg, and that's going to be added on to the current prop n. That's good. OK. And R needs to be uncommented or uncoded. So all right, so now we have a prop n hat. And then we're going to infer body with that prop n hat. Correct. Uh, yeah, what are we going to do with the type? Uh, just infer it. Uh, oh yeah, okay. Yeah, and then just make some logic variable for the output. 
and then we're going to make the type of this current lambda be arg type to ret type or whatever. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, um, yeah. Uh, unified type with uh, arg type arrow res type. Right, I'm going to point the res type. Fresh. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Refresh some stuff. So I need to fresh um, arg, arg type, body. Uh, they've got prop end, I need prop end hat. Um, and res type. So now let's make a, a rule for um, um, variables. All right. I realize I need to go back and add a fresh here as well. Sure. Get lost. Some point. Uh, condition then else. Um, that's it. Ready for the next rule? Uh, I think a symbolo. Uh, if the term is as yeah, then we have a local binding. So now's the trick. <laughs> we need to extract out from the proposition environment that the term, you know, looking up the term, is of a particular type. So. So remind me again why we're not doing an association list mapping kind of on the left a, a, a variable name and on the right a... Uh... Yeah, um, so we have a proposition environment now that uh, basically it represents the same kind of information, but uh, now we can learn information from branches. So that's just the way that we... Once we learn information in the branches, we just shove it into the proposition environment and then let something else infer some extra stuff. Uh, I, I don't know how equivalent it is to the traditional A-list, but say we're, we learn something about the car of A. So just, just uh, you mm. know, it's not bull A car. So it, just the syntax didn't quite work uh, the, the way that you did it. Uh, oh, but could we, could we, if we learn something about the car of A, could we write it as R A? That's exactly the same, yeah. Okay. So, so, so I think it makes more sense to me to do it ordered this way, because we're looking up, you know, either A or the car of A or whatever, and we're getting back a type, right? Yes. So if that's more convenient, then that's fine. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so now's the trick. Now's the trick. We need to prove that... Um, yeah, so we need a proves relation or predicate or whatever that takes in a proposition environment and a... So we're going to end up calling a provo with proposition environment and the term and a given a particular type and some no some fresh type. Why does it have to be fresh? Why is it not the type that? Yeah, you're right. It's the same the thing. Type? Yeah. All right. Um, that's it for symbolo. Okay. Yeah. Provo of n term, and that will succeed or fail based on whether that actually has that. Yes, I may have Provo slightly wrong, but uh, so that the general form of Provo is that it takes a prop env and it proves a proposition 
with, within the prop end. But uh, with Symbolo, we're always interested in a, in a positive proposition. So, yeah, maybe let's... Okay, let's change Provo to take a prop end and a prop. Tam? And that prop could be a negation. It could be not. Yes, but in the Symbolo case, we're going to prove list term type. So now if, we need to shove things into the proposition environment from if. So the first thing we need to do is to get the propositions out of the condition, uh, out of the test. So now we need to explicitly say what the propositions are in the test, which is the, the function we started writing up there. Okay, so... We need a then and else proposition from this. Uh... Yeah, so in the if rule, we're going to get a then proposition and an else proposition from the uh, from inferring the conditional. Then we're going to use the respective ones in the prop end when we infer the then and else. So yeah, we're going to extend with the then prop. Uh, exactly, yes. That's it. Okay. So now we need to populate these then props and else props. Uh, populate. Uh, sorry, we need to specify exactly what the propositions are for every expression. Yeah, okay, so sorry, let me add some, uh, some freshes here so that we're still correct code. Um, I think that's it there. Here, we aren't doing anything new. Yeah, okay. All right. Uh, so, so we have to. Is are we going to this this function now? Correct. So now we need to say that let's change the true type and false type to then and else props. Uh, yeah, just change the name. So if we have false, then we the then prop is going to be impossible and the else prop is going to be trivial. So we need ways of representing these two propositions. Um, okay, well, so when we're inferring true-false types, then prop and else prop. All right, let's see what you're going for now. Um, So, I guess, is Will still with us? I am. All right. So, if we wanted to do um, failure as kind of our, our impossible, right, then we would need to, we'd probably need to split infer true and false types into two different relations and put the inference of then and the inference of else into a con D. So we only kind of go down the one branch that our condition suggests we go down. Uh, that it seems like if you're going to implement it that way, yes. Um, I'm I like not that, yeah. yeah, I, I, I think you should go for it, whatever you feel is most, uh, yeah. Yeah, so we need a con D where the first one gets the then prop and checks the then branch, and then we need another condi that gets the else prop. And so we need two, we need two relations to extract out. Um, yeah, we need to split infer true false types to yeah. infer then prop and infer else prop. Now you understand that sort of sort of the implication of this is that you will not be able to 
um, directly compare the types you get back from the two branches, right? Because Condi really splits the world. So you will not be able to say the if branch has this type and the else branch has, or, you know, yeah. the else branch and whatever, right? So you're, you're just going to have to split the world and they, they live independently of each other, right? So mm. if, that's, if those are the semantics you want, then yes, the Condi is in what you want. Does that make sense? I don't know. You tell me, Will. That... Well, I don't know. I mean, I had a very different way of writing this, so so I'm not I'm not 100% sure. I mean, I, I guess uh, I don't know what your typing rule for else is exactly. You know, well, in, in the standard Hindley Milner, you want you want the uh, else and you know you, you want the uh, the two branches to have the same type, but in your world, they don't have to have to have the same type. Is that right? In our world, we have like unions and subtyping. So I'm assuming we're going to implement this at some point. So this is they don't have to be the same type. They, the if expression will combine the two types into a, a, a super type of both. Yeah, so as soon as you said combine, Condi is pretty much out. Okay. I don't think you can use a Condi, uh, or at least not the way you're thinking. Um, yeah, yeah, no, that, that sounds right. Because you're not going to yeah. know, I mean, you won't be able, each branch will exist uh, independently, right? So, so yeah, we need. So if if we uh, find a branch is impossible, we need a type to represent that, a a, a bottom type, uh, which can hash f be that. Oh, that's pretty disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we can make it a symbol. Don't we have like records or something in this game? Records. <laughs> records. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I just tried to what write. What is that? Okay. And I, was I would like records, to have so. records in Mini Canron, so that's another call out. If anyone wants to add records to the unifier for Seams Mini Canron, that would be great. But in, in uh, Core Logic, do you have records that you can do unification over? I doubt it. Anyone know? Hmm. I don't hmm. know. Okay, so here here's one way of doing it. Here's one way of doing it. Well, I, actually, I don't want to say. You, you all keep doing it. Yeah, You're let's do fine. it. You're doing yeah. fine. I'm not going to yeah. say anything. Just I've got my own way of thinking about this, but yeah. if I tell you, then I will, will infect your thinking. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. No, seriously, because I've got a way to do it, and I don't want... You all have a way to do it. It's better to have two ways of doing it, right, than, than one yeah. way? Yeah. Because my way may not work, and then uh, then you'll end up thinking about it my way, and that will be bad. Yeah. But you, you don't keep doing it. You don't keep doing it. You're good. So what right. I'm, my claim is that we need an explicit way of saying this proposition is impossible. Right. Well, I'm gonna go for hash f. Okay. That's that, that's fine. And then else prop is guaranteed, right? The yes. Hash. And it's just the opposite. Well, okay. The the trivial proposition doesn't doesn't guarantee anything. It just says that we don't really know anything interesting about this branch. So whatever. It's just a unit thing. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so it would be just as um, uh, well, it would be kind of valid to say that, that hash f has both uh, hash t for both propositions, but it would be more interesting if we actually gave a more specific uh, proposition. But anyway, uh, yeah, so for, for hash t, it's the other way around. Okay, so is hash f and hash... Using hash f and hash t, yeah, let's do something different. Um, <laughs> Triv so... and... And so call this uh, like unit. Okay, so the way I'm used to it is um, the symbol TT and the symbol FF for tr uh, for true and false. Yeah. Or vice versa in this case. Uh, correct. Okay, so the then prop will definitely not happen, and the else prop is. Will we'll happen. Know. We don't know yeah. anything new from that. Just try. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then if it's then our then prop is TT and our um, else prop is FF. Okay. Right? I like it. Okay. Okay. So yeah, let's what will this do? This uh, Provo 
Do we need prove? Let's run something that doesn't trigger Provo, like uh, if hash t, then hash t, else hash t. Let's infer that type. So. OK, and then after that, maybe can, can you walk us through the code then and kind of explain what's going on? Do we know what's going on? <laughs> Well, explain uh, us what's in your head, what you're trying to no express. One knows. I, I, I think no I understand one. it so far, so I could do that, too. OK. All right, so the query you wanted to run was going to be the program what? Infer if hash t, hash t, hash t. So infer on the term if hash t, hash t. Hash t. Hash t. On the empty proposition environment, some Q, I don't know, whatever. Yep. What does that do? I, uh, can I just have an empty define? I probably have to return something, don't I? Yeah, Provo isn't being called here, so whatever. Yeah, it should, I guess it shouldn't matter, right? Okay. Uh, all right. Um... OK, so can you explain what this query is saying, at least? So we're trying to infer the type of this if. OK, and what should the type of it be? Hash, uh, should it be Boolean or hash t? Uh, have we even <laughs> specified that? We haven't specified that. Well, I don't. I mean, <laughs> you should know what the, the expected answer is, right, before you test it, I say. Sure, but that's what Feynman said, right? Oh, wait, right. yeah. On on the second, never do an experiment unless you know. What wait, the so what should you return? Should this this will return. This will work because uh, if the else branch was hash f, this wouldn't work because in the if case, the the then and else branches have to have the same type, and we have no way of combining the types, but they just happen to be the same. Okay, so that's where the union is going to come in, but it's not there yet. Correct. So this is this is like Henley Milner rule for for if right now. Yeah, exactly. This is right exactly. now. Yeah, we're saying infer condition to be bool. So yep. we're asserting that they must be bool, and then we're also trying to get the then and else propositions out, and then we kind of recursively infer given those propositions. So won't that recursive inference invoke proof? Uh, no, the crucial oh, thing is that hash t hash f none of all. Yeah, proves is only ever called uh, to prove something in local because that's kind of the, the beginning of the uh, uh, the part of the environment that a proposition talks about. So that's the kind of the the interesting bit. Okay. So okay, so we should get bool back, right? And we got bool back. Yeah. Uh, okay. Can you do a run star by the way? Does that terminate? No, sorry. This should be fine, I think. So let's yes. run start as terminate. Let's change the bool to um uh, to like a singleton type, like uh, list val hash t, list val hash f for the, uh, the the types of hash t and hash f. No, no, I mean uh, in the condi, the big condi part where we actually give the type for hash f and hash t. Give oh, it, uh, no, oh. in infer, sorry. Yeah, the uh, list val hash f here. Yeah. But a single list. This is the type. So I'm just representing what this type is. And uh, list val hash t. So those are now singleton types. Correct. So we should get out hash t from our example at the bottom now. Uh, oh, I didn't reload. Oh, didn't rerun that. So, uh, so right now we're failing. Okay. And that's because uh, we we infer the condition, 
and require that it be a bool, and in fact it is now a val hash f or a val hash t. Now we need subtyping. Yes. Do you really need subtyping? Well, we could... I mean, can you do, like, bool val hash t or bool val hash f, and then say just that you have to infer something that's a bool val type? And have a logic variable as to whether or not it's a hash T or a hash F? I mean, that'll let us go to the next step if, if that's... But I don't think in general that will be enough for what we're trying to accomplish, so we should start integrating the... the... Yes. So what we need is... Uh, so we'll, I, Let's see. I think what we want is to, in the infer for the conditional, put a logic variable at the end and then say the logic variable is a subtype of whatever. Like, have some subtype relation, which is probably the hardest thing I could think of saying. But, uh, I don't know. Subtypo. All right, now is when it starts getting interesting. Yeah. I mean, everything we've done so far, I think, is is uh, pretty, pretty standard mini Canron type inference stuff, but... Now it's funny. So let's say it's a subtype O of bool. Wait. Oh, subtype O of bool. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, not type. Of course. Right. So. Uh, so subtypo and child type, parent yeah. type. Yep. What are we branching on? So if it's a vowel of hash f, then it's a bool. So Wait, the parent or the child type? Oh, oh child, yeah. If the child type unifies to vowel hash f, then the parent type unifies to bool. Well, oh, sorry. Is that like a boolean o, or is that just that there's no point? Um, I don't think there's probably a point. So, so sorry, the parent type is meant to be bool. So what I was thinking is, say we had a uh, a val a singleton type for numbers. So we'd have a val of some n that there's number o of n. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking of uh, a little bit ahead. So, can we do that with booleans? I mean, it's... Uh, well, I mean, you, you, like I was saying before, if you want to have a tag for bool val, right? Well, um, I mean, we can write our own boolean though. I mean, I don't, the system doesn't have, have a boolean constraint. Because it's a finite domain constraint, you have to enumerate all the answers, uh, all the boolean values explicitly. Otherwise, you can run into unsound behavior in the presence of disqualifying constraints. Okay, well, let's let's do that. So, shall we do a... Okay, so we could say boolean o child type. No, boolean o of what's in the val of oh, the child type. Yeah. yeah. Uh, all right, so... So you need to change that to, a, to b instead of hash f. Yeah. Need a syntax back, quote. Back quote. Back quote. I'll get there, Matt. All right, Bulino of B. I'd probably put that fresh B inside of um, that Condi clause. Okay. I, I think in general you're probably going to want to have non-Booleans, so. Um, might want to restrict the scope. Yeah. All right. So. Does that work? Or is Boolean O not a thing? I have to go implement Boolean O now. Oh, cool. It's going to be a thing in a second. <laughs> yep. It's uh, pretty, tri pretty trivial to write. Okay. 
it's yeah, it's remarkably uninteresting, really. I mean, the only thing that Bolino gives you is that now you have one case instead of two, right? So it just makes your code for subtype a little shorter. There's Bolino. Okay, so where are we? What are we doing? Subtypo, where are we calling it? Bull. This might work. I don't know. Give it a shot. We should infer the type hash t. Hey. Now put hash f as the test. Well, do, do you want hash t or val hash t? Is that is val hash t yeah, right, right type? Val hash t. Okay. Uh, so I put hash f as the test, also hash t. Okay. And this should fail if we go hash t, hash t, hash f. Alright, so I shouldn't be changing these test cases. I should be adding more. And I should be doing these as run stars because there's no reason not to. Um, so you were saying... Just make the else branch hash f. So the most recent one we did was that, and now we're doing that. Right? Now we're doing that. Yes, correct. So this fails because the return type is being unified as in Haskell, ML, Hindley, Milner. So now we need to get a T1 and T2 from the then and else branch or then type and else branch, uh, else type on line 41 yeah. and 42. Yeah. yeah. And then we need to create a union out of those, a union type. Okay. And then something like um, union O T one union O. I don't think this is a union O. This is union normal, and what? then we, we unify that with type. Do you want to be able to run the union backwards? I don't think so. Because the T1 and T2 are going to be logic variables mm -hmm. in the worst case. So we just, OK, well, let's write union O. Uh, and, and tell me what you were going to write. Tell me what you were going to write as though it wasn't didn't have an O on it. I will once, uh, yeah, I've seen yours. Uh, so so T1, T2, yeah, type. Or union. Um, but I don't really know. So we need right. a way to represent a union type. So I suggest the list starting with the symbol U and then a, a sequence of types. OK, so I'm just, this is just going to be a unification of U. T1, T1, T2, 2, union type. That's exactly what I was going to write in line. I was just thinking that you don't gain anything from that, and but that's fine. Okay. So is a union really a set? Is that a set operation? I guess so, yeah. <laughs> but do we... The question is how whether we really need to represent the setup or, or whether we need to actually execute the set operation or actually, you know, if we can just represent it and kind of we don't need to simplify the expression. So let's make this work that, that that's there right now. So what we need to do now is to make subtyping aware of unions. Okay. So let's say the... Let's say that the child type is a union. So every one of the, the elements of the child type needs to fit underneath the parent type for this subtyping check to be true. 
Yes. All right. So then we're going to sub typo. Ah, so yeah, that that might be easiest. So are we saying that union can only take two things, and if we have a union of three things, that's a nested union? Sure. Yeah. Let's say that for now. Uh, so yeah, T1 has to be a subtype of parent type, and T2 has to be a subtype of parent type, and we're done. Okay. Now, this should work. Load. Ooh! Bang! <laughs> awesome. Wait, did it work? Uh, yeah. It works. Yeah. Well, this funny. Hash T, hash F. You know, easiest type ever. Too easy. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Try should, harder. We, uh, should we make a lambda now? I think it's time to make a lambda. So let's... We haven't even run it backwards. No, no, I don't care about that. Let's. <laughs> we haven't even used the proposition. How, how dare you? How dare you, sir? You can run it backwards once we're done. <laughs> I will, mister. You yeah. don't understand will. <laughs> I know. He, he's, he's already infecting our minds. We wanted to do it this way, and he wants to do it inside out. So... You know, <laughs> give it to yourself. <laughs> You're already influencing us. Influencing us. <laughs> so He's let's write a lambda. People about running backwards. All right. So you want to run with a lambda? I want to run with a lambda. And what are we going to learn from the lambda? We want the lambda to annotate its argument to be of type. Wait. Before you do that, you uh, have you tried one that doesn't type check? Have you tried a case that shouldn't type check and, and shown that it doesn't work? We don't actually have any. Uh, so let's introduce numbers and the increment operator. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd feel more comfortable if you had some tests that showed that things that you can't infer certain types, right? Yeah, I mean, the, we don't have any terms for this to fail that are interesting. Yeah. All right, so... Now, we, we in our term language, let's introduce numbers and increment. So should we start here? No, that is uh, that Proper. is a proposition language. So in, oh, in uh, okay. so, uh, yeah yeah. Here. All right. So, so number row term will be of type, uh, you know, num unifies num with type. Actually, let's make it val of term. And see if the const if the constraints work out in the subtyping check. Ah, wow, that, that that's really cool. If that works. Okay. So then okay, now, now we can let's add a test that will fail. Okay. Let's say let's have a number in both branches and replace Q with num. So the reason that failed is because union one two is not a num. Uh, actually, an even easier one would be uh, replacing the two with one. So just have one on each side. And well, we haven't we haven't added the uh, subtype check yet. Correct. So let's do that. So it'll be the same as the boolean o, except we use symbolo and num. Well, actually, we could just have a, a con D inside there. Yeah, you, uh, inside the val case, just put a con D. Uh, okay. Con D, Boolean O, con D, Symbolo. We're not running it backwards. <laughs> All right, Symbolo B, uh, so that's going to be, or sorry, you, no, number O. Uh, number O. Uh, and that's going to be num. 
experiment type. Oh, so that should be sufficient for this test to pass. Okay. It's not. Let's go back to the subtype check. Okay, so I, I've got a request uh, for you guys. What's that? And, um, so, so probably not everyone in the Hangout is completely familiar with sort of type systems and writing type inferences and all that. Can, can we just pause for a second and maybe you all can give kind of like a high level explanation of what it is we're trying to do and maybe what's what's going on just so that folks who are trying to follow along can uh, maybe have a little more to hang on to? So right now it's very much like the the classic type inference that you might run you might make in mini Canron. The only thing we've added right now is that the then and else branches can return two different types now. And all we've done now is add a union type that, uh, that combines the two uh, things. So if we go to the bottom of the buffer, uh, Michael, uh, uh, yeah, look at our test. Our first test, this will work in ML, uh, in Hindley-Milner, rather. Uh, actually, both of the, the two top tests will. Um, but one interesting thing we've added is singleton types. So hash t in our language. Uh, Michael, could you write a test for hash t, getting the, the, the type for hash t? In the empty prop. And just ignore that list there. We're not using it yet. That's the proposition environment. So yeah, run that test. So if we look at the buff, we infer that it's of type val t. So instead of saying it's boolean, we've actually made it more precise. Uh, so if we do a, a hash f test, uh, infer the type for hash f. So you can see, uh, yeah, now we have a type for hash f. So we can no longer use unification to, to just say that uh, the, the then and else branch return the same type. Like, but we have subtyping. They, can't, they do return the same type if we kind of uh, use subtyping to convince ourselves. So um, So, so in particular, that that test that says if hash t hash t hash f, it, now that would still type check under Hindley Milner because you would be considering hash t and hash f to be bulls, but here because you're being more precise about the type, you actually have to have subtyping and say, well, we have more precise types. Hash t has its own type. Hash f has its own type, but they are both subtypes of a of of another type, which is basically the boolean type. Is that is that accurate? If we make it more concrete, Michael, go to, to, to line 53. Here's where we test 53 and 54, where we, we infer the type for the then and else branch. In Hindley-Milner, that T1 and T2 would just be type, which is the, the parameter that we have for the, the function. Could you just show us the, uh, the type argument? So the 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 current type that we want to infer for this uh, this expression. So in Hindley Milner, we would just say the then branch is of type type, the else branch is of type type, and they would be syntactically equal. But now we need to relate these two things uh, to the original type via subtyping. Uh, oh, okay, okay. And you're doing a union O in your if, right? Um, we should inline that union O. It's it, it's it's misleading, I think. No, I disagree. I think you should keep the union O because I think union O should actually be smarter. I mean, well, okay. I, I think uh, eventually, it if T1 and if T1 and T2 are the same type, you don't want to be taking. I mean, you don't you don't want to be building up a data structure, right? That's going to say. Uh, okay. you, you want you you want to simplify it, right? 
So, so I, I would kind of keep you, you know. Oh, you're saying if one choice would be that we can unify T1 and T2, and if yeah, that, then then the union type's just T1. If T1 and T2 are don't aren't the same if they have a disquality constraint on them, then you return the union type, right? Because because uh, there's no reason, you know, if you really do get back the same type from both branches, you don't want to have an explosion, you know, with the union type. Does that make? I mean, do you agree with that, Ambrose? Yeah, I guess I was. Yeah, I. I that makes sense. So I mean, if they're both ints, right? If they're both num, you don't want to have union num 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 num. You just want to have num back. I guess the interesting case, I was thinking without without logic variables. So the interesting case would be if we try and union O A and B, which are both logic variables, but we already know that they're unifiable. So uh, what I was thinking was do a make union constructor that, that isn't relational. And then you just kind of make the union and then unify that onto union type. Uh, but this is much smarter. I like this. No. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the problem is that if, yeah, once you have logic variables, it gets trickier, right? I mean, I, in fact, you might even want to break up the if into, like, three cases, um, depending on failure and stuff like that. that. That's something we could explore later, but, um, yeah. So, you know, it's turned out, Ambrose, that handling sets in many Canron is quite tricky, and unions are basically sets. Yeah. So, uh, you, we have to be very, very careful how we handle the sets, or we can get into really nasty behavior. I mean, even this handling of sets isn't really sophisticated enough, um, but it will it'll get us get us there uh, most of the way. I mean, at least it's sound. What's uh, not sophisticated but, enough here? Well, if I have int and int and bool as types, for example, now you have you know union int bool and union bool int, right? So you can get exponential explosions. Right, stuff like that. So, that th there there may be some ways to handle that where you sort the types in different ways and stuff like that, have an ordering on them. Um, but let's not worry about that right now. So those okay. are running backwards issues, right? Just making sure. Yes, those are those are running backwards issues. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay, so where are we? Well, we were trying to add this number, number OB and say that the parent type is num. So we should be able to add a failing test that's, that claims that a number is a bool. Or that, you know... Well, we, we couldn't get the succeeding test to work either. Yeah, you're right. I forgot. Um, what, what, what... Yeah, wait. Um, looking to make sure that there's... Do we need an infer true-false types? Or no, because okay, okay, no, because we're not using numbers in our condition. And yeah. Things in the condition. But um, you might as well add one, and it's exactly the same as the hash t case. Or can you just do a cond e on the on the first where the hash t line is? Is that? Yeah, that would be doable. Cond e. Yeah. And then number O term. Yeah, that's it. Oh. Where is my cursor? All right. Yep. Okay. Right. Let's, Let's retry all of our tests. I'll do a clean interpreter so that you know what's going on. All right. Union type. And this one we still fail. What is that saying? Okay. Num. Let's go to the if case. Have, have well, you yeah. tried just have, have you tried just inferring the type of one? That'd be an amazing idea. All right. Well, so we're getting val one out of this. Let's just do even simpler, just one. Yep. Just for a sanity check. Oh. 
So we get that one out, but can we should be able to say num, right? Because it should, should be a subtype? Should be able to. Well, no. Uh, we should be able to say infer one num. Really? Yes. So um, this is... OK, well, but for the number of term, we're saying it, the, the type is literally val of that, right? We're not. Ah, really so now we need a subtype check of type ah, ah, aha. So do we want? I think that should be a subtypo. Or do we only want to do the subtype checks when um, when we need? Sorry, I think we need line seventy needs to re uh, uh, replace the un uh, unify with subtypo. Okay, and we need to do that then for these other for hash f and hash t as well, right? Yeah. So we should have tested the for booleans as well. All right. Well, so let's add the failing failing. Yes. Test. Those tests that obviously would pass, but we just, <laughs> of course, hash t is a boolean. Uh, bool hash. Wait, do, do you have bools? I thought you had like a uh, list bool something as a type. Nah, bool is, is our type. Oh, wait, did you did you change that? Uh, if we look at us, well, we have particular values like val hash t. But that should also be a bool, and subtypo should enforce that relation. So when we see boolean o, or sorry, when we see a val of something that's a boolean, we say that the parent type is bool. Okay, so boolean o hash t and oh wait, val hash t and val hash f are types, right? And bool yep. is a type. Yes. And val hash t is a subtype of bool, so you can put in bool. And that subsumes the val hash t and val hash f. You get both of them, basically? That's what we're meant to have. We don't have it yet. OK. So the problem is that we need to, um, for each of these literal cases, we need to be using subtypo for the returned result of the inferencer. That's it, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So now you're now. Okay. So subtype has to. You have to be using subtype all over the place. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So subtypo takes a child type and a parent type. So instead of unifying this, I'm just going to say subtypo. Right. Correct. Uh, okay. So David had an observation. Subtypo is doing this normalization step that. You could maybe sidestep. Otherwise, you're losing information from subtypo if you carry around both the parent and the child type in a pair. Yes. Yeah, uh, so, so we might want to have two different functions that we have. You know, one's an infer, and it comes up with a single concrete type, and one, you know, and, and then you use subtypo afterwards in either the test or a wrapper function or something like that. So do you only really need the subtypo when you're doing things like if? Um, when you need yeah. to be able to take sort of two different branches that might be inconsistent? No, even even the case where we where we infer that uh, where we uh, assert that one is of type num, we need subtyping because one is a val one, right? Okay. David, well, do you do you want to um, explain a little more what you're thinking? So, David, it, you do lose information if you specify what you want the type to be. If, it, if you just leave it as Q, it will just unify the two types, and you just get, you lose no information. But the, the subtyping, uh, the expected type should tell you how much information you need to prove about the term. So you only lose the information that doesn't matter. But, uh, it, yeah, cool. Okay, I'm not sure I get it. <laughs> no, I think we can get this working before we can explain. Okay, okay. Fair enough. Okay, so we're going to use subtypo? Yes. Go back. Uh, we also need it in the lambda case, where we unified type, line 67. Okay, now let's write our tests. Uh, well, let's run the tests that will make this, yeah, the, the one that we've been doing. 
Uh, okay, so first we'll check if hash t is a bool. Now it is. Yes. One is a num. So where did that logic variable come from? That's q, right? Okay, so that's fine. Yeah. And then check this one. That's still failing. Or wait. What? Well, I think we should stop for a second and explain what on earth just happened. Okay. So. Yeah, I'd appreciate uh, that. I don't. I don't understand. Okay, so let's look at the the, the test on line eighty two. Oh, sorry. So there we should get out. Oh wait. Okay. Yeah, that that wasn't what so, I. So so hash t is going to give you. Um, so is that going to give you type val of? Uh, so that's you back I didn't. Val. Know. I I know it's wrong. So our subtypo should also have a rule that says a a type is a subtype of itself. Ah. Excellent. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. That's it. So now if we ask the type of hash t, we get two choices. The type of hash t is both val hash t and it's a boolean. Now you only want the uh, most specific type, is that right? Or do you actually want both? Uh, well, it depends if you want to be able to s s write, write a statement like this. If you want to say infer the type of hash t and state that I believe it to be a Boolean and you want that to come out true, then you need to have both. So, so okay, maybe, uh, David, if I understand what you're saying, are you saying that, you want, you, that we might want to pass around both the principal type and sort of the, the subtype? Um, so that you know, we, we we keep track of the principal type at all points in time, but we also have the subtype information if we need that. Um, okay, so or or okay, well, all right, Ambrose. Well, well you can, okay. We so can, David says you can carry around both val t hash t and bool. Well, we don't need to because val t plus subtyping gets us bool. Okay, uh, well I guess the question is from the type inferencer, when you do a type inference on hash t, do you want both val t and bool, or do you just want it back val t? Val hash t. Or sorry, yeah. If, do you want both types back as principal types or not? What I was thinking is we just need val hash t. Because yeah, because yeah. yeah, so how are you going to get that, I guess? So yeah, let's do it until it breaks. <laughs> so okay, so so there are a couple of things here. I think um, if we if we carry around both, I think that will work. You know, so sorry if 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 we allow the type produced by the inferencer to be basically either. So it goes two worlds, right? One where it's val hash t, one where it's bool. In some circumstances, the wor world where we had the less specific information, bool, will end up repeating computation. And in some cases, the Boolean one will fail, but the val hash t will still succeed, right? So in yeah. terms of the correctness of the inferencer, it probably doesn't matter, and it would provide a convenient interface. But for efficiency, we probably just want to be returning the most concrete type from infer, and then maybe have a wrapper or in our tests say, well, we you know we expect the inferencer to find produce a type for hash t that is a subtype of bool. So is it actually possible to throw away that bool that we just saw? I think it probably is. I think you might have to write a sp separate relation that gives you like the principal type. Mm. Well, so so what? Why do we need? Why do we need that at all? So I'm proposing that we change our tests to be instead of infer hash t bool, to be infer hash t concrete type, or maybe I'll even make it fresh. And 
Well, we definitely want to see it, I think. I would, I would put that in a run. Well, the, the weird type is when Q is fresh. Uh, the, the weird case, right? When Q is fresh? Yeah, because that we only get one answer if it's if if the type is concrete, but we get two answers if the type is a, a, a logic variable. Yeah. So I'm I'm proposing our test be like this. Well, maybe we can wrap that into a driver or something, but you shouldn't. I mean. Well, uh, sure, sure. I mean, I don't care about that. I'm just saying the logical content of the test should be this. It shouldn't be just the result of infer we expect to be. Okay. What, 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 what do you think about that? Um, Sorry. Amber. Yeah, I, I guess. That's just doing the same thing as, as the other case, though. Well, but it means that internally, inside the inferencer, um, you don't have the more generic type uh, floating around as, as a second possible value and splitting the world repeatedly. So the way we, you know, using sub subtypo inside the inferencer, that means that every time that, you know, we call infer on a sub term, we then kind of con D, split the world, and, and do all of the work twice. Don't you have to do that anyway, though, to handle cases like if? I mean, you can't do that outside of the call to infer in general, right? You have to have the subtypos inside of the inferencer, I think. Well, but there are specific places where we need to use the subtypo, mm -hmm. like when we're asking whether the condition for if subtype boolean. Okay, well, uh, okay, what do, you, what do you think, Ambrose? I don't know if, if, if I agree with this subtypo thing. Like... This means that we need to provide a type every time. Or, okay, what we could do... Sorry, why do we have to provide a type every time? So, what is this subtypo achieving? I mean, so, so if we didn't provide a type, and it was a Q instead of a bool, right? If we deleted that subtypo line, what, what would be different? Well, because, because you want to be able... So you initially had tick bool here. Infer hash t tick bool, right? Yeah. And I'm saying I don't think that should be I don't I don't think that's the right question. Because I think infer should always just return the concrete type. It should return val hash f. Right? And so this would produce would not fail. No, that's actually, yeah, that, what, that's well why are you giving the type anyway? I don't understand. This query seems weird to me. You should just be giving, like, you know, you, you have a concrete program, expression. You should have, like, a queue there or a concrete well, so type we're, there. We're just talking about a fully instantiated test, right? So I'm treating infer as check here, to be clear. I'm thinking check. Okay. Yeah, but you're actually giving the output type also. You're not just infer, you're just not just grounding the input expression. You're actually grounding the output type. That's the part I find a little strange with this test. Oh, the sub, the extra subtype line, or well, I, I don't <laughs> mind subtype, but but it seems so, weird to have quote bool or quote val or something. It will. Yeah. But he's saying he's saying infer. He's thinking of his check. So if you had annotated oh, an annotated function with type bool, and you want to check whether that assertion is true, then you'd be instantiating bool. We actually already have this. Uh, case. Actually, I disagree with that. I, uh, I don't think that's how the check should work. I think the check means, if you're doing type checking, it means the input expression has a bool on it. You mean It means you have a type annotation on the hash T, right? Okay, um, well... For okay. a type checker, you don't run... You know, The type checker is that the input is both the expression and the type. Here, we're just giving the expression. We're saying what the type is at the output, but that's not how a type checker works. A type checker either gives you true or false as the output, in some sense, right? Well, here it's giving you true or false by succeeding or failing. Yeah, but what I'm saying is there is no annotation. There's no user annotation on the input expression saying what the type is that it's supposed to be checking against. Do you mean that, there's, do you mean that we're doing inference because we already know what hash t is? Is that what you mean? 
Like, it's we already know the type of hash T. I mean, in Java, right? Like, when you declare... So Java does type checking, right? And when you, when you say you have a variable, and that variable, you know, you're going to assign that variable true, you have to say that that variable is of type Boolean, right? So that's part of the program. That's part of the input expression. That's not, like... You know, the Java compiler isn't telling you, yeah, this is a bool. So it's part of the input. So that's the part that doesn't feel like type checking to me. It only feels right. like type checking because we actually have a relational system, but this is really type inference. This isn't type checking. What was type checking is your lambda, because you actually do have an annotation where you're saying on the on the input argument what this type is. But really, every expression in this language or so every you know every every at least elder expression you have to be able to specify somehow what the expected type is, right? Because otherwise you really are doing inference. Yeah, this is too subtle for me right now. <laughs> Let's move on. <laughs> checking or infer instead of being an infer, right? It would be it would be a check, and it would take an expression and an environment, but no type because the types would be annotated on the expressions. And we would be confirming that the types annotated on the expressions, or at least some part of the expressions, actually lined up with the content of the expressions. So we're doing both checking and inference here, right? Well, we're not doing checking because there are no annotations on the expressions right, saying types. We are checking on line 95. We are checking that hash t is of type bool. I disagree. OK. So, so checking means that I give you an expression and I tell you what the type is that I expect for the expression, right? I'm saying I'm claiming that this expression has this type, but it's all at the sort of the input, right? The, the type checker gets both an expression and the type that, that we're claiming goes with that expression. Sure. And then basically the type checker either says yes or no. This type checks or it doesn't, okay? That's not what we're doing. Well, here we're saying that the first input, you know, that hash t, that really is the, in, the user input, metaphorically. So we're giving an expression, which in this case is very simple, it's just hash t, but we're not also giving a type for that expression. If we said hash t bool, right, and then the output of the type checker were either hash, you know, was like succeed or fail, then that would be a type checker. This is really doing type inference because, um, you know, we're saying that we're not saying what the what the type of the expression is. We're just saying we've got some expression, right? And then that's then our system is producing bool as the type. But that's doing type. That's really doing type inference. It's not doing uh, type type checking. So checker would look something like this, where you had a check function, and you passed in program text that was annotated with a type. Well, sorry, jumped around somewhere. Okay. Um, so our program text, you know, say we have an express, an annotated, you know, type annotated expression that needs to be checked, and we pass in the expression and, and the type in that program text. So that would call infer, right? It depends how you wrote it. Well, that this would work. You could pass in infer hash t bool. And when you when you find that annotation expression, you just pass it to infer. So, okay. Uh, I'm thinking, yeah, I, I guess I'm conflating infer and check. So I, I get what you mean here. Uh, that I that, mean, yeah. yeah, so David points out that it's, it's kind of silly in this example because you have a Boolean, and the Boolean sort of have its, has its type implicitly. But if you yeah. think about it in terms of variables, right, like if we had variables in the language, like in Java-style variables, right, like whenever you're using a new variable, you have to declare what its type is. Right, so it's in the input expression. It's in the original source code. You have the, you know, you you have the types that in the code as annotations everywhere. Right. So in the type closure or type racket world, generally what you would do is annotate the overall type of a function. So its arguments and its returns, and within the function you can do, you know, you don't have to specify things. You infer, if I understand correctly, and then the only thing that you're really checking is the function signature. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is super subtle. I, I, I think, yeah, OK. Let's just call it whatever we want to call it. <laughs> and I'll understand a little more as we go. <laughs> well, let's just do an inference for now. 
Is that all right? Whatever that means, and I'll learn what an inferencer is. So let's do an inferencer. A true inferencer means you don't have to put type annotations anywhere. But your in, your input source code doesn't have any any. Type I mean, you don't have to, but I still want to. But is that now? Am I doing type checking now? Well, to me, type checking means you have to put annotations everywhere. But you could still use an inferencer as a checker. Yes. So, Will, does okay. it count as type checking if some variables are annotated but some aren't? And I infer the intermediate ones and make sure that the ones that are annotated are correct? Uh, well, depending on how you do it, you might end up with something called gradual typing or maybe occurrence typing or something like that. So, yes, I think that's exactly what's interesting about this approach is that with the mini-canron implementation, I think we can sort of blur the distinction between all those things because we can have user annotations that we check, say, hey, these have to be right, but we can also infer missing annotations. So I think that's really what's interesting. <clears throat> Though that might be undecidable in general, right? Uh, it depending on it, well, it depends on the type system. It might be undecidable. I mean, okay, it, it depends. There's you know, there are lots of different types. There are plenty of decidable type systems that have decidable type inference, like uh, Henley Miller. So all right. So how about we make this a checker? where the top level of expression is required to have a type? Would that make sense? Um, sure. What I was that thinking would... is, let's just add an extra case for annotating an expression with a type. And then we can just, you know... Well, so, uh, I mean, the thing is, you can always, an you know, we, we could have the syntax consistent, where we don't special case it. We, we demand that every expression have a type on it. It's just that those types can also be fresh logic variables, and we can infer. So syntactically, we don't have to have any special cases. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a different way to do it. It depends what you're interested in. To me, that's the general way. I don't and it's actually it avoids having that. special cases. What do you mean? I, I don't understand. So, so Will is imagining, I guess, like, like if we took like type bracket or something, right? Because this is not the case in type bracket. Um, if we took type bracket and did a transformation such that every named variable, every kind of point at which we bound something, you know, bound something to a name, mm -hmm. where there was a type for that, but then in mini Canron, for the ones where the user didn't actually really specify something in the original type bracket source code, mm -hmm. that would be a fresh logic variable. Aha. Okay. And then you'd infer, you'd infer what it's supposed to be from its usages. Yeah, and you'd write it as a type checker, but because it's mini Canron, it would be doing the inference. Yeah. So I think that would be a... Yeah, that's weird. That, that, it's a hybrid approach, right? You, you put as many annotations as you want, and mini Canron tries to figure out the rest of them. Yeah. Anyway, let's... let's yeah, let's... Okay, so, so I guess two, two comments, meta level. One is we're coming up on, like three and a half hours or something, so uh, let's <laughs> cut it off. Let's cut it off in another 18 minutes. All right. uh, secondly, um, Orchid is saying, let's get the if v inc v zero example working. Okay. <laughs> so, okay, let's so let's just that. try to get one of these things working. We can play with the rest of it all day. Let's have, let's add ink. Let's add ink. Okay. Let's, get, let's get something simple working. We can play around with this. So. All right, so for now, it's going to be an inferencer because that's what we're halfway right through writing, not a checker. Is that good? Yes. Well, yeah, let's do what we were doing before. You don't need your... Okay, 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 fine. The subtype check, whatever. I don't mind. So, or val hash t, so the type of hash t should be val hash t which is not a very interesting statement, but then if you add the subtype, then that, um, yeah. yeah. Okay, and... So, so Orchid says now you need function application and get something that can fail to type check. No, well, increment is, is the easiest way to, to um, do that. So we'll add, a, a like, a constant... Because you can't increment a bool, you mean? Uh, yeah, exactly. Okay. Okay. 
Actually, so, applications are kind of difficult. Okay. Yeah, app applications always the tricky part. Yeah. So we're going to unify the Let's term call it. Call it. with yeah. ink uh, variable. Yeah. Or do we wait? We do have variables, yes. But ink uh, expression. That is an arbitrary expression, yeah. Which needs to infer to the type bool, uh, num. Okay, so we say infer of expert to be num. In the current proposition environment. And actually, what we really want to say is expert type, so infer. Way we're, the way we've written it, right, or the way I am writing it, which was not necessarily the way you originally wanted to write it, but um, if, we're, if we're having the output be a concrete type, then when we call infer, we want to say subtype O of expert type is, um, which type did you say again? Uh, num. Num. And add a prop env to line 74. Um, and now in uh, the result type has to be a subtype. No, is is equal to num. Okay. I think. Yeah, I think that's right. So. Yeah. Okay. So now let's try and increment bulls and stuff like that. Now let's increment a number first. All right, so we are going to infer the type of ink of one. So that should, I, I believe, give us no. Quite, quite ink. Oh, yeah. Uh, somewhere num is unbound. But now if we try and ink a bool, that does not have any type. Okay, so now let's add a test for lambda. Annotate the lambda to be a num, uh, to, to take a num and increment it. Okay, so... And this is where proves comes in, which we have um, yeah, we haven't done that yet, right? Yeah. Okay. Do we need to call this lambda, or are we just creating it? This this is sufficient to for us to have a big problem. Um. This should hopefully have no answers. Oh yes. So right now, well, right now I made provo just return void, so it blew up on that. And yes. Can actually do something I guess this will work if you just say member o prop m prop or whatever yeah. you, know, you know what I mean. Uh, if it's syntactically in there, it'll probably work. So this is ultimately going to be a condi, but for now it's just going to be if it's syntactically in there. Yeah. Okay, and I don't happen to have a copy of member, so I can write one. What if the thing you're looking for is in a union? Yeah, this this is a stupid so it's, test. So it's, it's not it's not really member in general, though, right? Definitely you, not. This you is have to look in unions. Way crazier. Okay. Well, so well basically, I mean, if you think about everything in terms of sets, 
This is very similar to abstract interpretation, by the way. Extremely similar to abstract interpretation. Um, if you think of the variables as associated with sets, right, and all these singleton values as just singleton sets, yeah. then this is exactly the same as abstract interpretation, basically. Okay. And we're just doing, we're just saying is, uh, is when we look up the variable, uh, is, is the type we're looking for a member of that set or whatever? So am I writing a member of? Actually, let's say, let's search the proposition environment for all the propositions that refer to Um, let's let's change prop uh, provo to take a prop env a variable and a type and uh, let's yeah make it a little simpler to think about so now we need to search prop env for any propositions that refer to var like exclusively and then assert that the type is going to be the subtype of what we want. What do you mean refer to var exclusively? So you know how we can have cars and couldas mm -hmm. uh, after the var in our proposition? So that's not what we want. We want a proposition that refers exactly to the var. Yeah, yeah, okay. And then we get out that type and make sure it's a subtype of what we want to prove. So this is lookup though, right? Uh, yes, it's lookup o, but in, of course, in the general case, you're looking it up. You're looking up the variable, and then you would be looking in like the the set or the union eventually. Oh yeah, because our propositions have they work with the association lists. They're association lists now, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I mean, if you didn't have the unions, you would basically, this would just be regular lookup O that we would normally write for a, either an interpreter or a type inferencer. Can you make the key of an association list a list? You can make oh. it anything you want. Well, well yeah. let's, let's do that. And uh, for now, let's make it the singleton list of a var. And when then add add pod. That instead of just an arbitrary term. Um, I mean, there are only we need to especially tag it. I guess. I why think just have it be. I mean, maybe we do have to tag it. I don't know. Well, you do what you were gonna do. All right. Tell me if you see a reason why it won't work. So either, you know, a pair with that as, um, or, or a list with that as its first element is yep. the first thing, um, or we have to recur. That, that'll work. That won't work? That will work, but once we add selectors like car and kuda, it won't work. But that's fine. Okay. Where many... Well, I can't name a variable car or something, right? So... I mean, I'll have to do something other than this. Yeah, yeah. We won't just be able to call Yeah. It. All right. So, um, all right. So, in this case, it's a dot d and that's n, and we are looking up of our in d for this. Do we need a disequality? By yes. Yeah. Okay, so actually, yeah, we want to split it in the same way, don't we? Um, yeah. So, yeah. How does that look? 
Looks yeah. good. That'll work. So now Pruvo just needs to look up um, the var in the prop env and look for the type. Ah. No. Get out get out a T1 instead of the type. And then prove that T1 is a subtype of type. As in yeah. subtype O T1 type. Hello again. That should do something. Let's see. So it was this test that we were trying to run right now. Yeah. And so let's load that. Uh, Pruvo. I'm calling Pruvo with the wrong number of arguments. OK, because where our call to Pruvo. In the local, in the variable case. Um, Just get rid of that list. Yeah. And that should be... So we've changed Pruvo to, instead of working on arbitrary propositions, it now works on the positive type proposition. So Pruvo now, now proves that in the prop env, term is of type type, or some subtype of type. Yeah. Yes. All right, so let's give it a shot. So what, what if there's negative information, Ambrose? What if, what if it says that, you know, some variables, some type, but you also have in the same uh, proposition environment that it's not that type. Are we detecting that? I have no idea. We're not. We're not there yet. Yeah. So okay. in, in, to introduce negative information anyway yet, so it doesn't matter. So I think the main idea is in if the prop the new proposition set the, the new proposition environment that we pass down the branches will have positive information in them that you can use in the variable case. So, um, yeah, it's, it's kind of a, an interaction between if and the variable case. Uh, is, that, is that right? Does that work correctly? Yeah. Hey! <laughs> um, so now, now let's add, let's make arg a union of val, hash, f, and num. Uh, yeah. Don't change any test cases. Add a new one, please. I think he did, right? No, I wasn't good on that one. Oh, whoops. Yeah. No, don't. <laughs> That's something uh, Kent told me. Never delete a test case. So this should fail. Uh, no, no, no. I, n this should now, just now invoke. Uh, actually, before we do this case, Add another case that's the same as 128. Uh, copy that. And uh, annotate arg as val hash f and invoke arg uh, and pass arg to ink. And what? Pass arg to ink. Ink. Okay, so that's what I've done here, right? Oh, oh sorry, arg. Okay, so that should fail because now we're trying to increment a, a boolean instead of a number. Yeah, so ink should say that its argument needs to be of type num, and we can't find a proposition that claims that it yeah that that the arg is of that particular type. Did that fail? Or could you run it for me? Okay, yeah. this is this is promising. All right. So now increment arg in the case that you're on right now. And this should fail. Does? OK. Now let's, now's the tricky part. Now's the tricky part. Now, now we need to write a test case that is exactly what Orchid was saying. Yeah, if arg inc arg 0. Are we inside of Lambda? Yes, it's exactly that, except um, the body has an if, the tests arg, and then the else branch is zero. And what's that else zero? 
zero. And this should fail. That should fail? Correct. That does fail. Okay, now we need to enhance the if case to learn something interesting from the conditional. Now we actually need to for infer true false types to give us something something meaty. Uh, so you're talking about changing the inferencer? I'm saying line 72 doesn't do enough. Yeah. yeah. So Okay. So what what I propose it seems like we're making progress but um, just in the interest of <laughs> keeping this manageable time-wise for a few people. Uh, I suggest we take some of this offline, um, or at least, uh, you know, if anyone wants to leave now, <laughs> knock yourselves out. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to keep going, okay? Yeah, personally, I'm not going to go any farther than, than getting this little piece to work. So Okay, you know. okay. Let's, let's, let's see if we can add this one feature and then... Uh, is then that that kind of what we're trying to achieve, and you know. Okay, and then maybe check it in the GitHub or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, sounds this, good. This would be a pretty awesome achievement. This one thing, I, I'm I'm done after this. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so the true, true false types needs to have an interesting case when uh, for a local for a variable. Can so go, go up to the definition for infer true false, and so if if you have a symbolo as the term, <clears throat> then the then prop is the proposition that says term is not false. Um, Whatever that syntax is. Okay. Term not val hash f. And the then uh, the else prop is term is hash f. Yeah, an unquote term. Okay, so so can you explain what this helper is doing? Is this is this basically when we're handling the if case? This is saying uh, what what we can assume in both branches considering what the test is. So this infer true false types, um, let's change the name to infer props. Um, it basically tells us the, the, the proposition for the, the true and false, false propositions that we can use in each branch. So if we're testing a variable as we are here, um, then we know going down the then branch, we can assume the variable is a true value, like as in it's not false. and if we're going down the else branch, we can assume that it is false. Like, it's literally the value false. Okay, so, so this is the additional information we're inferring as we're going down the branches. This is well, exactly the arms that. Of the yes. Okay, gotcha. That makes sense. So the trick now is, when, I think, yeah, so go to the then branch case, Michael, uh, in the inferencer. So now, instead of just appending onto the prop end, we need to somehow combine the then prop with the prop env to derive. Um, so let's write down the propositions that we actually have for this test case. So go down to our test case. So in just as we go down the lambda uh, into the body, we have um, uh, arg is of type union val hash f num. So that's all the proposition environment is when we get to the if. Um, yes. So when we when we check um, increment arg, we're going to have an extra proposition. Um, we're going to have the proposition that arg is not hash f. Yeah, we fixed the, the unquote. All right, so... Um, 
prop, uh, the prop env at ink arg. Is that appended onto arg is not val f? And what we want to do is automatically have a proposition that says arg is of type num based on these two pieces of information. Mm. And I leave that up to you. I have no idea how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> if we get that, this will just work. Just uh, it'll go straight through. So we know that the argument arg is a union, and we want to kind of simplify the union. So if we have, you know, multiple pieces of information about the argument, um, then we want to Sorry. look at the pieces of the union and see if we can, we have a negation for any of them. Yes. So the first function we need to write is called env plus. Let's, let's use the symbol plus. And it takes a proposition environment and a proposition and returns a new, new environment. All right. So I'm getting the feeling that this might actually take a while to figure out. Yeah, this will. So I'm not sure. We might want to call it for today and come back to it. Yeah. OK, so what I suggest then is um, maybe put some notes at the top of the file saying what the next thing to try is. Yeah. There's another, OK, so, so a couple high level questions. First of all, I'm curious, Ambrose, how this feels like writing it in this style versus how do you normally write these things? I don't know. Uh, um, this is like, I don't know, I can easily translate. It feels like I can easily translate what I'm used to into this style. Uh, if that's what you mean, like I'm pretty comfortable. Well, I mean, is it any shorter? Is it any more declarative oh. than how you usually write it, or I mean, it feel? the amount of uh, boilerplate you'd have to write to get to this point, right, would be insane. Like, uh, this is crazy how, how far we've gotten. It's it's awesome. But so why would it take so much boilerplate? Well, we need representations for types and things like that. It's just like kind of. The schemey way of doing this is so succinct, it's stupid. Uh, but, <laughs> but yeah, I, we haven't actually got to the tough case. This is the tough case. So I, I, I okay. don't, this is what I'm thinking is that if this is ever going to explode, it will explode when we're trying to do this inference right now. OK. Yeah. Well, that sounds like something, something that uh, we should definitely try. Um, the, the other thing I have, I mean, first of all, we also haven't tried running it backwards, which I think would be make be very interesting. Um, but the other option, or the other thought I have is that it may be possible, I'm not sure if it's possible, it may be possible to encode this information more directly in Minicameron. So uh, encode unions as condies in a way. I don't know if that's possible. But in particular, the negative information using disequality constraints. Um, so, so just be much more, uh, <coughs> there may be ways to make it uh, much more direct. Uh, I don't know. I don't know how well that would work out. It'd probably have a different set of trade-offs, but um, there, there may be other ways that are uh, more direct to encode some of this, especially the negative information. Uh, it'd, be, it'd be fun to play around with that once we get something working that, that uses this representation. Awesome, yeah. <clears throat> so, Michael, um, let's just write a comment that says, yeah, exactly. Need to combine these two um, to derive arg num. <clears throat> um, and just put a note, um, this will involve writing a function env plus that takes a proposition environment and a proposition <coughs> and returns a new proposition environment. Let's think relationally, whatever. Uh, yeah.
and just uh, go grab the, the then case and then uh, paste it down here. This? Yes. And say the then case then becomes, uh, is, is now uh, uh, so write a, you know, a, a body like an all or a fresh uh, just before this in infer a, a fresh nil and say uh, uh, env plus prop env then prop so env plus prop env env prop oh sorry <laughs> prop env then prop prop env prime or p whatever uh, and then pass infer prop env hat and similarly for the else branch That's it. So the env plus, the purpose of that, the result of env plus, so prop env hat coming out of env plus, should have should have simplified each binding, right? I shouldn't have these duplicate propositions. I don't know if that matters. I think because we're doing a subtyping test in the variable case, it improves. Because we just want a subtype in proof. So it will just go through all the the propositions as long as we find one that we want, uh, that, that's useful. Um, the okay. okay, but I at least have to produce one that combines these two and have it be an end prop end hat. And it needs to be one that's positive because that, where, where uh, this is the if case, so we need to also remember that the, the point of our proposition environment is for the, the variable case to easily be able to extract out the proposition it needs. So env plus has to give a proposition that the local case, the, the variable case, can easily pick out. That's the point. Yep. All right. That's it. All right. We can end now, Will. All right. Well, thank you uh, so much, Ambrose and and uh, and Michael for uh, live coding. I guess we're trying to get a relational version, mini Cameron version of the uh, parents typing parents typing system used in type bracket, right? That's it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So. Uh, and if we pull it off sort of the way that I'm hoping we can, then we'll actually be able to do type inference and all sorts of other stuff in addition to type checking and things like that. So it'll be very interesting. And also, hopefully, it'll be nice and short, maybe clean it up, maybe add some constraints. Uh, be very interesting to play around with it. OK, well, uh, so Michael's going to create a GitHub repo, I think, for this. And Yeah, uh, I can send you a link, and you can tweet it. Ambrose, is there a paper or anything like that that has sort of the typing rules that um, people want, if they want to learn more about the occurrence yeah. typing stuff, uh, should look at? So there's this paper. I can add a link to it in the YouTube channel. There's logical types for type languages. And I think, did, didn't Will, didn't you do a talk on that one? <clears throat> Me? I thought you did. No, I didn't. I didn't off the beaten track uh, talk on how we need better tools for for type systems, which was not a. Uh, you, well wasn't that with not a, Didn't you use this example? This uh, this yeah, but. Oh uh, yeah, that was the one. Okay, yeah, that yeah. was the one that like uh, we had trouble understanding. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, I recently have put out a draft that has another kind of more direct explanation of occurrence typing, but I don't know, it, there's also, uh, I'll tweet my ICFP. Okay. So what I mean, term occurrence typing what? as opposed to like the term Will was using for the stuff in Rust? 
Oh, the uh, type state? Yeah. Well, what about it? Is it a current typing and type state something different? I don't know what type state is, but it sounds exactly the same. Like, it sounds like they're uh, solving the same problem. Okay. Um, Hang on, is that the right link? Oh, I think it's at least closely related. That's, yeah. So if you follow that link there, you'll find a link to, to the paper, the, a draft of uh, a paper that explains occurrence typing, kind of. Uh, it, it kind of assumes that, well, I tried to write it so you didn't have to read the previous paper, but it's probably easier just to read the previous paper. But yeah. So what, what I would like is just, like, a couple inference rules, you know, for, for what we're trying to implement. Yeah, so that's uh, in the first paper. OK. If you can get, like, a page number and say, like, inference rules for these three forms or these five forms, like, that's kind of what I want to ah, so I actually find the inference rules are easier to read than the papers now. Yeah, so look for TF and TVAR in logical types. OK. And, uh, it says page six. And L update. L update is the kind of the, the where we just got to. Uh, L update takes two propositions that are related in some way and derives something new. So that there's a logical system and uh, and kind of a, a type system. So, yeah, those three, TF, TVAR, and LUpdate, are the essentials of occurrence typing. OK, cool. All right. Well, uh, it'd be interesting to look at the typing rules and see if that gives us maybe a different feel also for how to implement this. I hope so, yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, y'all. Um, this was, I guess, another epic session. We basically did four hours, so, uh, yeah, <laughs> four hour hanging out. I don't know if that's too long for people or not. Um, I guess people, people can, can always leave. <laughs> yeah, 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 so... Um, I kind of enjoy these uh, kind of live coding sessions, and I think it also gives people a very accurate view of what it's like to try doing this sort of research for real, because that's wow. what we're doing right now is real research, right? This is not, this is how it, how to do this. <laughs> this feels exactly like the way it works, like when, you know, we're not on camera. Um, so, yeah. you know, maybe some people find that interesting. Uh, okay, so, so I guess we'll try to keep it this way where you know, we talk about general interest stuff early on in the Hangout and then maybe do some then epic the four hour hack, yeah, hack session. Yeah, we'll do, do the four-hour hackathon <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, if you all want to do some more hacking on this this week, let me know. Uh, otherwise, if you want to hold off until next weekend, whatever. But, uh, right. I mean, I think we should push it. I mean, we're uh, seems like we're pretty close to have something that works, right? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Have a great week. Hope to see you next Sunday. Thanks, Will. Bye. Thank you.